morning. Good morning. All right, we are back in the record in file 23110 FC, People's State of Michigan versus Shonda Vander Ark. This is uh, day three of a jury trial. My understanding is, my recollection is, we, Mr. Ferguson was just done testifying. Mr. Roberts, uh, anything before we bring the jury out? Uh, just briefly, Your Honor, my next witness actually will also be my final witness. That will be Dr. Jo Joyce DeYoung, the medical examiner. Uh, through Dr. DeYoung, I do anticipate admitting, their, well, they've already been admitted, but uh, presenting the final basically four exhibits to the jury. It's the post-mortem uh, autopsy report, a copy of the death certificate, uh, the cause of death listed, as well as the two final photographs to present to the jury. And these are obviously the worst of the worst in terms of the photographs, and we, and we will follow the same procedure we have followed before, give them an opportunity to see the photographs, just pause briefly, let them look at the photographs, and then take them back, and they will not be displayed on the screen. Um, after that, I do anticipate resting, and um, I guess we'll take it from there. Okay, Mr. Johnson, anything before we bring the jury Just briefly, Your Honor, uh, as, as the court knows, uh, it, it should this matter uh, be something that needs to be appealed, that the Court of Appeals have some strange ideas uh, and one of the things I want to dispel is that we are waiving our objection to the photographs as we discussed. The court has ruled as to their admissibility, that, that's fine, uh, but we're not waiving our objection for further for appellate issues. Thank okay. you. All right. All right. Uh, that understood. Let's bring the jury out. Please rise. <laughs> All right, well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here on time. I uh, appreciate your, again, sticking to a schedule. Uh, the, just for the record, it looks like a juror put a question in the box. I, I believe this is for Paul Ferguson. And unfortunately, Mr. Ferguson has been excused as a witness, so the question cannot be asked him at this time. Uh, so we uh, will not ask him. Now, if he's recalled as a witness, potentially we could do that, but that's up to the attorneys uh, at this time. So with that, uh, we'll move on to... Mr. Roberts, your next witness, you go ahead and call it, please. Thank you, call, officer, or call Dr. Joyce DeYoung. Morning, Dr. DeYoung, go ahead and come on. You raise your right hand, please. This matter now pending, do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so if you got it. I do. All right, put your hand down, grab a seat, please spell your name for the record, or state your name for the record, spelling your first and last. My name is Joyce DeYoung. J-O-Y-C-E, last name is D-E, capital J-O-N-G. Thank you, and could you state your occupation for the record, please? I am a forensic pathologist and the medical examiner for 12 counties in Michigan, including Muskegon. And where are you currently employed? I'm employed at the Western Michigan University Homer Stryker MD School of Medicine in Kalamazoo. 
And you said you are the currently the medical examiner for a number of counties here in Michigan, including Muskegon. Is that correct? Yes. Um, you do serve some of the other adjacent counties as well. Other adjacent counties in Southwest Michigan, Muskegon, Mason, and then um, uh, Grand Travers and Leland. The, uh, and could you just briefly go through your qualifications? I don't believe there's going to be an objection to your qualifications or your, your being qualified as an expert, but could you just give the jury a brief overview of your educational and uh, professional background? Yes. So I am a board certified forensic pathologist and uh, my educational background starting with college was I graduated from Grand Valley State University with a Bachelor's of Science degree. I then graduated from Michigan State University College of Osteopathic Medicine with my DO. Uh, I'm a physician. Uh, I did a one-year internship, and uh, which was a traditional internship rotating through multiple areas uh, in the hospital, followed by four years of a, uh, an anatomic pathology fellow uh, residency where I'm learning general pathology. And that was followed by a one-year forensic pathology fellowship. Where, uh, where I was trained specifically in forensic pathology, which is the study and investigation of sudden and unexpected deaths, um, and to, to answer questions about those types of deaths. So I'm board certified by the American Board of Pathology in both anatomic and in forensic pathology, so general pathology, which is a very broad uh, study of disease for physicians and things like, you know, if you have a skin biopsy or something biopsy, that goes to the pathologist, but then um, uh, I'm subspecialty trained, like I mentioned, in the uh, in the study and investigation of, of deaths. Uh, I've been uh, employed as a forensic pathologist since uh, uh, since I finished my fellowship, which was in uh, 1999, and I've been the medical examiner for Muskegon since January of 2000. And as the medical examiner for Muskegon and for the other counties, what are your responsibilities there? The responsibilities for the medical examiner, there are certain deaths that are required to be reported to us. Not all of them. Uh, most deaths are natural and most of those are, are, do not get reported. Uh, but when a death is sudden, unexpected, traumatic, uh, or just it's very unclear maybe why a death occurred, that gets reported to us. Our, our duties uh, with those deaths that are reported are to investigate them on behalf of the medical examiner. We work, uh, we work in parallel and, and uh, with other agencies that are investigating deaths. And, and we will then, in many of them, if it's indicated, do a post-mortem examination, an autopsy, uh, in order to answer questions. The biggest questions that we answer are what caused the death. Sometimes it's very apparent, sometimes it's not. But what was the cause of death? And um, that, that could be something, the cause of death is, there are a lot of different causes. There's thousands of different causes. You could die from lung cancer or a, a, you know, a, a myocardial infarct due to coronary artery disease. So there's lots of different causes. Um, a gunshot wound to the head could be a cause of death. But we also render an opinion on the manner of death, and that's part of our role as the medical examiner. We're required on the death certificate to complete that part. And the manner of death, uh, we're, we're limited in the state of Michigan. Uh, every state has their own, but, but they're, they almost all follow this standard, and that is that you, death could be classified as natural, as a suicide, as a homicide, as an accident, or in some cases as indeterminate, where um, uh, there's not adequate information to make that, to render an opinion on that. And could you sp sp uh, speak a little bit more to what those causes are? Natural sounds pretty obvious, but if you could just briefly explain those different types of, I'm sorry, not causes, those are manners of death. Sure, so the, the manners of death, um, if it's a natural death, that means that the natural disease was 100% it was natural. So you died from your lung cancer, you died from your myocardial infarct that ruptured or that caused an arrhythmia, or you died from your... Um, uh, uh, you, you died from any other kind of natural condition, all right? So um, pancreatic cancer, I always keep thinking about cancers, but there's a lot of different natural diseases from COPD. Um, so, so those are the natural ones. If it's an accident, that means that, um, and some of those like uh, motor vehicle collision and, and where, we're, where nobody really intended to do harm, but somebody runs a red light and there's a collision and there's an accident. Um, 
and, and uh, uh, we classify those as accidents. Somebody may have done something wrong, but, but, uh, um, but it's so classified as there wasn't any kind of intent there. For a suicide, there, there was, uh, it appeared, you know, if, if you're looking at all of the circumstances, and, and in order to, to determine the, the, the manner of death, you do have to have the circumstances of the death. And that would be, um, you know, to, to gather the information. And, and I like to use the example of a gunshot wound of the head, for example, using the circumstances. And let's talk about that to try and differentiate a suicide from an accident from a homicide. You're pretty sure if someone dies of a gunshot wound that it's not a natural death. There's something that's exogenous that's outside that's, that's happened here. But if it's a gunshot wound to the head, how do you decide if this is a suicide, an accident? Uh, someone dropped a gun and the gun went off or a homicide, another person shot at that person with the intent to do harm or to frighten or to hurt them, um, or is it a suicide where they shot themselves? And you have to gather information from the scene and from the findings on the body and from the history in order to make those and classify those deaths. Uh, so that's generally more, and so homicide would really be the death at the hands of another um, and suicide at, at one's own hand. And, um, uh, that that's generally how did that answer your question? Yes, I, I okay. believe so. But, but just so we're clear, homicide is classified as what? Death at the hands of another. And then the final cause you said was indeterminate. Is that, you know, for lack of a better way of putting it, when you basically can't figure out exactly what the reason sure. was for for the cause of that? Right. If there's inadequate information. Um, I would offer Dr. DeYoung at this point as an expert in the field of forensic pathology. No objection. Okay. The court will accept her as a. Uh, expert in the field of, you said, forensic pathology? Yes. All right. Sir Roberts, before you continue, can you, we have a sidebar real quick. Okay. All right, you can continue, Mr. Roberts. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> not quite sure where we left off, so I guess I would just ask this. Doctor, did you become involved in the investigation into the death of Timothy Ferguson, which occurred on or around July 6th of 2022 in the city of Norton Shores, County of Muskegon, State of Michigan? Yes, I did. And um, how did you become involved in that process? This was a death that was reported to our office. One of our investigators responded to the scene. Uh, and. Um, uh, a determination was made that an autopsy was needed, and I conducted that autopsy uh, on uh, July 7, 2022. And uh, you referenced there an investigator. Can you just explain a little bit to the jury about the role the investigator plays and how that, that coincides or, or works with uh, what you're performing in terms of the uh, overall examination? Yes. So, uh, as I mentioned, we cover a lot of counties. That's a lot of uh, geography there. In each county, we have medical examiner investigators. They are non-physicians who are trained to perform investigations on behalf of our office. When a death occurs, one of these investigators uh, will respond to the scene, gather information on our behalf, will communicate with the forensic pathologist, the medical examiner, or one of the deputy medical examiners, and 
they then arrange for, in, in cases where an, an autopsy is needed, they'll arrange for transport of the, uh, of the deceased body to come to Kalamazoo for that exam at, at the medical school. So in this particular case, you said that one of your medical examiner investigators did respond to the scene and uh, conducted an investigation on behalf of, of the school. Is that correct? Well, on behalf of the medical examiner. On behalf of the medical examiner. Right, so, yes. So, yes. And did, uh, as a result of that, did you have the information from that investigator at the time that you conducted the autopsy? Did you have some of it? What? I had some information, yes. They, uh, they always provide us. We need to have, we need to have some kind of context for, for how somebody was found as opposed to uh, uh, just blindly going in and doing an exam. So uh, they, they provide that information in advance of the autopsy. Then do you wait for that information before you make a determination that an autopsy will be conducted, or is that? The determination of an autopsy, there wasn't a lot of, uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, discussion over whether an autopsy was needed in this case. Uh, it was a, a essentially a pediatric case of someone who died, and uh, the findings on the scene, everything looked like this was not, uh, the, the, this could this could possibly not be a natural death, or even if it was, we would need to know what that natural condition was. So there were a lot of questions. There wasn't a, a cause or manner known. Um, but there wasn't any question in your mind upon hearing the facts and circumstances that an autopsy had to be conducted? There was no question. Then what is the process involved in actually conducting the autopsy? And you can use specific examples from this case, how that takes, takes place. Sure. So uh, when we first uh, when, when we first start, the, I actually start with, with at least uh, reviewing the information that's available from the investigator. Uh, then we do an external examination of the body. Uh, we'll take X-rays of, of the of the body, but we, we look at the body just as it's received with all of its clothing on. If there is clothing and any other any other materials, we will take photographs of that. We then uh, remove the clothing from the body and, uh, and repeat that process, clean the body up and take another full set of photographs. To do the internal examination, all of these findings are, are documented as well. Uh, we, we measure the body, we weigh the body. Uh, we, we, uh, we will also then take, um, we'll make incisions in the body, incisions in the chest and the abdomen so we can uh, end up allow us to get access to all the organs uh, from the, the, the neck, the chest, the abdomen, the pelvis. We then also make an incision in the scalp and have to make uh, cuts in the skull in order to examine the brain as well. That's all done. We also are gathering body fluids for testing. Uh, we can do testing on the blood, toxicology testing. We can do testing actually on eye fluid to look for other findings. The, it's called the vitreous. Uh, and these are all things that were done in this case. So a lot of that we're looking for, I also took samples to look at things under the microscope. So we're looking um, un under the microscope for any kinds of evidence of natural diseases or other findings like that. Um, all of these things get uh, documented and, and sometimes obviously you don't have all the answers on day one because you're waiting for other laboratory tests and toxicology exams, but that all then finally gets integrated <coughs> into a report uh, that provides uh, the information and, and documentation of what the observations were. And could you then speak to uh, specifically with regard to Mr. Ferguson, uh, your initial observations and what process was, uh, what you did to, to reach a determination as to the cause of death for Timothy Ferguson. Sure. So uh, it was it was readily apparent uh, upon viewing the body of Timothy Ferguson that uh, he had a very low body weight. He appeared extremely emaciated. Uh, he uh, he was 68 inches tall, uh, inches long, inches tall, uh, and he weighed 69 pounds at that point. Uh, he had, it was clear he had really a loss of, uh, of, of all of his body fat. His cheeks were, were very narrow. Uh, he had, you could, you could see and count all of his ribs. And even internally when we're looking at him, uh, he had, in, in areas where you typically have some body fat in, within your abdomen and, and in different areas, there was none. There was only the little bit of connective tissue that would normally hold the, the, the fat. But you could see uh, 
all of his bony prominences and on his back he had started getting some pressure sores because there wasn't a lot of padding in between his bones and his skin as well. So where those areas had pressure, the skin was starting to break down. So you talked for just a moment about the, his weight and height. As it relates first to his height, uh, I think you indicated he was 68 inches tall or 69 inches tall? He was 69 inches, uh, 68 inches tall and weighed 69 pounds. Right. So as it relates to height at 68 inches tall, how does that rank in terms of an average, uh, and he was 15 at the time, how does, how does he fall in the scale for average uh, height? Right, so in order to determine that, if you've ever taken a kid to the pediatrician or whatever, but there are growth charts and there's normals for what people should be, what kids should be as they grow up. And they, they have kind of, uh, you know, a percentile, like if you're the 50th percentile, about half the population might be taller than you or way more at that age, at that same age, and half the population's gonna weigh less than you if you're at the 50th percentile. Uh, and so uh, in, in this case, for his age, uh, at the time he died, at 68 inches, he was in the 60th percentile. So 40% were taller than him, and 60% uh, are shorter than him at that at that age. For so his, a little over average. So. Yeah, a little over average, but no, uh, very normal so height. I think you were likely going to get into, so the next question would be, can you do the same analysis that relates to his weight? His weight was 69 pounds. That was um, on the chart less than the first percentile, essentially zero percentile. Every other child at that age largely would weigh more than him. Uh, it, was, uh, it, it was a really uh, severe, um, em extreme emaciation. And how, you said you've been a medical examiner, at least for Muskegon County, for 20 plus years, is that correct? Yes. And do you get a lot of cases where a person is has died as a result of emaciation or starvation? Mr. Roberts? I think it goes to the issue as to whether or not, uh, the, well, the question here is whether or not Ms. Vanda Ark was responsible for the death of the child and whether or not it's, it's unusual for a person to have been uh, essentially starved to death. And I think this medical examiner is certainly qualified to testify about whether or not there have been other cases, other similar cases uh, that have resulted in starvation. Your Honor, I would concede that she, she's qualified to testify to that effect. However, I, my argument is this, this relevance to this matter. What, what relevance does it have how often this happens in the state of Michigan or the United States or in the world for that matter is simply not relevant to the facts for this jury. Yeah, I, um, I think she's testified to where he, he landed on the scale of, of normal adults his age. Um, I think asking her how many other cases like this she's seen is, is not relevant to this particular case. So I am going to sustain the objection. Thank you. Um, so we talked about the height and the weight, and you said that part of the analysis also involves a um, internal examination of the organs. Is that correct? Yes. And uh, specifically as it relates to your internal examination, did that examination, uh, combined with, with the overall examination, reveal any other contributing factors to Timothy Ferguson's death? Well, at the, t at the time of autopsy, one of the findings we had were that the lining of the stomach had what we call um, Wisniewski spots. These are dark brown spots that are in the, uh, in the lining of the stomach, all right? And it, they're a little bit unusual. They're very uh, well demarcated, dark brown, almost black spots scattered over the inside of the stomach. And uh, at the time of the autopsy, uh, I, I certainly took note of it. Uh, the, these are seen on occasion. Uh, most commonly they're seen in individuals whose body temperature is very low, uh, who have hypothermia, a hypo meaning low temperature. Um, uh, and they can also be seen in somebody who ha who's, a, who's a diabetic and goes into diabetic ketoacidosis. Those are the two, by far the two most common scenarios that we, that we see this. Uh, so I noted it at that time, uh, and that was a significant finding. Uh, the other organs, like I said, had changes you'd expect from extreme emaciation. Uh, some organs, they, the organs tend to get much smaller as well as the body. Uh, but but the, uh, the hypothermia, the, the findings in the stomach 
were significant, and then later I learned that there were uh, reported prolonged ice baths, and I believe that, that was a, th those were truly hypothermic type Wisniewski spots. And uh, in what way would those have been a contributing factor, if any, to the death of Timothy Ferguson? Well, the, the spots themselves are not the contributing factor. It's an indicator that there was hypothermia. Uh, it, it supports that, that finding that that was, uh, that was present at the time. And in, and in, this, in this scenario, uh, especially in someone with, uh, with this extreme emaciation to be subjected to extreme cold temperatures, the body is not at all equipped to, to handle that. Uh, typically, the body, you know, someone can shiver and that will help raise their body temperature. We have a lot of mechanisms within our own body to try and keep us warm and eventually you have to, the, w when somebody does die of hypothermia, there's typically, or if that's a major contributing factor, there's some reason why they didn't extricate themselves from the cold and go put on blankets and get warm. And uh, in, so, so in this case, though, how the hypothermia contributes is it does just continually weaken the body and it can also slow the heart rate and, and, and uh, cause and contribute to that process of, of dying, essentially. Um, it, it, so if I understand you correctly, a, normal, a person with a normal body weight or even close to a normal body weight, there, there's a mechanism within the body that will protect you from that. Uh, even if you're exposed to it and, and not able to extricate yourself from that uh, in some fashion? Well, y you'll, be, you'll be able to last a lot longer. Um, obviously, if you're in an ice bath or, or you get into cold water, at some point your body can't handle it anymore. But uh, in someone with extreme emaciation, it's gonna, their, their capacity to overcome that would be markedly diminished. And, and what is the reason for that? Well, because the, the body itself, uh, the mechanisms that it can use, the, the use of fat as an insulation, uh, the ability to be strong enough to, to shiver. There's other things that are going on with different uh, hormones in the body from the adrenal glands and from the thyroid gland to help warm the body as well and to increase your metabolic rate so that you're, you're generating more heat. But with all of those systems really uh, in, in very poor condition because of starvation malnourishment, uh, they're not responding adequately as well. So you're going to be much more susceptible to the cold. You said that uh, there, there's, a, there's one other, uh, there may be more than one other, but you list, I think when you talked about it, you talked about um, the hypothermia being a potential cause, and then there also might be a disease or ketoacidosis, I think is what you referred to, it could be a contributing factor to creating those spots. Were you able to rule out other, other causes as potentially contributing to why you observed those spots in Timothy Ferguson? Yes, yes. And so diabetic ketoacidosis, although typically uh, glucose levels will decline after death, even if they're normal, uh, in somebody who does die of diabetic ketoacidosis, when we test the eye fluid, we'll see um, elevated glucose levels in, in that area. It's a, a very stable fluid that we can detect that in. And we'll also find ketones, uh, which are a product that happens in the body and gets into different body fluids. Uh, and neither of those are present. We, we, this, was not, uh, this was not diabetes, uh, and this was not diabetic ketoacidosis. So Timothy Ferguson didn't have diabetes or, no. or, or any, any, any disease that would have otherwise explained those spots? No. Did he have any, any diseases or anything that you could uh, determine that would have caused his death other than the malnourishment <coughs> and the contributing factor with the hypothermia? No, he did not. Um, as part of your analysis, does, does it involve obtaining any available medical records uh, to, to review? Yes. And did you attempt to do that for Timothy Ferguson? Yes, we did. And what was the last medical record you were able to, well, first of all, I guess let's talk about the process. How did you go about obtaining those medical records? The process is to try and, number one, find out which medical facilities he was treated at. Uh, we couldn't find any evidence of him being treated here, but we have an investigative staff and they called around, they called other family members of Timothy to find out maybe in Oklahoma where he had been treated and we did get some, some information on that. Uh, and so with that then we, as the medical examiner's office, we reached out to these agencies or organizations and healthcare uh, organizations 
to, to get copies of his medical records for review to see if he had a history of a significant natural disease that might have been the cause for why he was like this. And were you able then to obtain any medical records for Timothy Ferguson? Um, you said you couldn't find any in Michigan. Right. Were you able to find some records or some recent records for him? We did. I think the most recent record we had was from 2019. So about, so, and was it from, I think you indicated it was from April of 2019 when we discussed it? I, I believe it was. I have a copy of it here. Okay. If you need to, but approximately. Okay. It, was, it was about 2019 yeah. and, um, yeah. I'm okay. just going to grab my report here. Sure. Um, if you need to refresh your recollection by looking at I it, I would that's like fine. to do that. Go ahead. Yes, it, it was uh, April 6th of 2019. So that was uh, over three years from the time Timothy passed away was the last medical record you were able to obtain, is that correct? Yes. And in that medical record, uh, is there anything noted in terms of any uh, diseases, any physiological problems with Timothy Ferguson that might have been a contributing factor to his death? I found nothing like that. Is there a reference in that report to his weight at the time in 2019? Yes. And what in, was that? His, in 2019, he weighed 95 pounds. And what percentile does that put him in, for, essentially, for uh, weight for a child? He would have been 12 at that time. Right. So at that time and uh, for, for that age, he was in the 46th percentile. Um, so right, <coughs> just right in average. the average range. Right. Correct. So I, I, I think you've testified, but just to make sure that we're clear, what is, in your opinion, what was the cause of Timothy Ferguson's death? So his cause, the other finding that I, I should, I'm going to clarify because it went into the cause, was that we were able to determine that he was uh, severely dehydrated as well. Uh, and that was from the testing on the eye fluid, which gave us additional information uh, that, um, that, 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 that demonstrated that. But his, his cause of death was... Uh, dehydration and extreme emaciation due to malnutrition and starvation. Um, go ahead. No, no, that's fine. All right. Yeah, there was a. I, I also contributed. There's. Uh, 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 there's another significant contributing condition, and that was something called exogenous hypothermia, meaning hypothermia, but it was from outside sources. You can actually have condition in your body where you don't make enough heat and that's endogenous so your body's not doing the right thing uh, but in this case it was uh, and most of our hypothermia deaths are from um, cold exposure um, and those that finding that cause of death get, does get reported and uh, is contained in the death certificate for when you make a cause of death determination that gets reported on a death certificate, is that correct? That's correct. And you also make a determination as to the manner of death, and we talked about the different categories of manner of death. Did you also render an opinion as to the manner of death for Timothy Ferguson? Yes, my opinion, um, based on all of the circumstances that I had available to, uh, to examine, was, was that the manner of death is best classified as homicide. And could you explain the reasoning behind that uh, finding? <coughs> Uh, this was this death was caused uh, by the actions of others to do harm, or or cause death. Um, for the record, your if I could just take a look at the exhibits that I've got up there for you. The, yeah, People's Exhibit Number Forty Two. Do you recognize that document? I do. This is a copy of the autopsy report. And is that the report that you prepared for Timothy Ferguson? Yes, it is. And does it contain the findings that we've discussed here today? Yes, it does. And if you recognized, I, I, I understand you don't necessarily <coughs> prepare document number 45, but could you explain what that is to the jury, please? So uh, the, the document number 45 is a copy of the death certificate. This is actually a document that is, we provide information, but then it's produced by the county clerk's office. And uh, does that list the cause and manner of death on the death certificate? Yes, it does. And does it contain your, your identifying information as the uh, pathologist in the case? Yes, it does. Uh, these have been previously admitted as people's 42 and 45 judge. Okay. All right, finally, Dr. DeYoung, the, the, there's two photographs there, and out of respect for Timothy Ferguson, we are not displaying those on the monitor. Um, if you could just take a moment and review those photographs and ask if you recognize what's in those photographs. Yes, I do. And uh, what is depicted in those two photographs? I think the number is probably on the back. So um, on People's Exhibit number 43, this is a photograph of Timothy. It's kind of uh, 
just from above the, the genital area up and it shows the front of his body without any clothing on. The, the, there's a ruler there and that ruler has our case number in it. It shows us that that was our, our um, w which case this was. And is that, if I could just stop you for just a second, is that one, and it, in fact the next photograph, photographs that are taken early in the autopsy process? These are taking after, <coughs> after any clothing that he was wearing was removed. Um, so that it is early before any incisions are made, yes. And the, and the second photograph, could you just identify what we're looking at in that yes, photograph? Yes, um, People's Exhibit number 44, we're looking at largely the right side of his torso. You can see his right arm as well. You can see his neck. But I think it, uh, both of these display the significant loss of, of body fat and uh, you can see the ribs and you can see the bony prominences. There's also actually a lot of uh, uh, scratches on there. In some of the areas that look discolored, it's because the, the, the skin is so thin, you can see tissues beneath it. Uh, it's very transparent, but there are also uh, scratches and, and, uh, and some bruises on here. Yeah. Thank you, Arthur. I have no other questions. I would like to publish those photos to the jury at this time. You may. Mr. Johnson, any cross examination? I do, Your Honor. Good morning, Dr. DeYoung. Good morning. Welcome back to Muskegon. Thank you. Uh, you and I have met, it's been a while, I'm Fred Johnson. Yeah. Yes, we I'd like have. to ask you a few more questions, if I may. Uh, and, and I guess um, where I want to go is right to, to, the, to the heart of the matter. Uh, you've ruled this matter to be a homicide. Yes. Were you provided with any other documents other than the physical body of this of this young man uh, in, in terms of your evaluations? Yes, I was. What, what other documents were you provided? I, uh, I obtained as many documents as possible. Uh, and so 
I, I will. I will give the list of that. Okay. okay I like it shorter. Did you get any police reports? Yes, I did. Okay. So there was information in the police reports that you used, is correct? And, and, and making yes. This, and helping to make this determination. Okay. Um, do you recall if those police reports included any information regarding uh, whether or not there were the the young man uh, refused eating, voluntarily stopped eating, or or, or stopped eating he stopped eating. Hunger strikes, I think they call them in the police report. There was some mention of those. Okay. But most but most of those but you saw police reports, correct? Yes, I did. And you saw and those did those reports have uh, do you recall who was well, do you recall if 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 the mother was one of the people whose information was listed in that police report, her, her comments, her, her, her arguments, her information about her. There, there, might, there was some early information uh, about given, provided by her, yes. Okay. Anything from Paul Ferguson? Yes. Okay. And in the, in the course of those police reports, uh, there are occasions when an, an officer who's writing up might offer an opinion, might offer an insight. Were there any of those in those police report? I, I didn't see much in the way of opinions. It was more uh, recounting um, what what was stated in interviews, uh, in very you know, sort of brief sentences about about what uh, uh, what different individuals said. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, uh, let me ask you this. Um, you mentioned that two years ago, 2019, it's four years now, uh, that uh, Mr. Ferguson, Timothy Ferguson here, uh, was in the 46th percentile of, of, of someone his age yes. in terms of his weight and whatnot. Uh, can you give us an idea of what that means? Is a person with 46th percent percentile, would, it, it, would a person... Might a person at the 46 percentile rate be considered chubby or obese? No, no, not 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 if they're. I, I guess if th that's their weight, uh -huh. and so kind of that piece about that would would it correlates with how tall they are. So okay. if this person, but let's say in the at that time they did not get his height. Yes. Okay. But uh, but so let's say he's um, you know. If, if he's 95 pounds and and 48 inches tall, you might say, oh, that that is, it's more of a body mass index thing, which is used some on occasion. Body mass index is you have to be careful with it because uh, sometimes people with a lot of muscle mass will have a mm -hmm. very high BMI, even though it's not unhealthy. Okay. But uh, um, now I forgot your question. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. So did I. Uh, okay. But but you answered it actually. All right. Okay. Were you ever given any photographs of of uh, Mr. DeYoung's, I mean Mr. DeYoung, Mr. Ferguson's siblings, uh, so that you could make a, a visual comparison as to their body body build types? I did. I was. I had no photos <coughs> of his siblings. Okay, including Paul Ferguson. You didn't get to see him. Is that I correct? did not. Okay. Um, you mentioned um, that that being. Uh, Emaciated diminishes a person's ability to fight off cold. Okay. Yes. For, for lack of a better term, uh, and sometimes they can't shiver. Might a person, even under uh, difficult circumstances, as as Mr. Ferguson found himself in, might be visibly shivering? Oh yes, yeah, certainly. They they would still shiver, but it, the capacity for shivering even to uh, to generate enough heat to compensate for the significant loss of, of body fat and, and, and body weight would also, uh, it, it would be limited in how much your shivering can help. Okay. One more, please. Dr. DeYoung, I don't have any further questions, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Roberts. Just a few Thank you, Dr. Um, Doctor, Mr. Johnson asked you about a uh, reference in the police report to a hunger strike. Um, 
And uh, is it possible that a person could die of starvation because they are on a hunger strike? Yes. And um, but for the reasons that the person is losing weight, is there any meaningful distinction for what the body goes through between if you're on a hunger strike or if you're denied access to food? The physiological responses would be very similar. And what are we talking about when we're talking about physiological responses? Whether you're going through a hunger strike, whether you're denied access to food, whether you have something that's causing your body to, to, to not process food. What, what right. physiological responses would Timothy Ferguson be going through no matter the cause of why he, he was weighed 69 pounds at the time of his death. Right, and, and uh, hunger strike is a broad term too. Uh, and sometimes people refuse uh, uh, people, and, and oftentimes it's people who are imprisoned who will go on a hunger strike, uh, that, uh, that they, will, um, they will lose weight, but some will say, all right, I'm not eating, but I will drink fluids. Uh, occasionally, hunger strike uh, individuals on hunger strikes will take a protein shake or something. But by and large, if it's a true, if it's a hunger strike where they're still a lot, they're still drinking water. Uh, the, their body, obviously, their body weight will, will will decrease if you're not eating at all. The body goes through a lot of physiological changes. Your ability to, uh, is even, I mean, in, in uh, Timothy, we saw it too, in some of the organs that are active in your immune system, they, they start to shut down. Uh, the heart gets smaller. Uh, the, the liver can go through, goes through metabolic changes and is no longer able to produce the energy your body needs, and the liver does a lot of production. There, there's all of these changes that occur. Uh, Timothy was also, though, uh, he was dehydrated, so he was, he was not getting adequate water either. And that, is, that, that, that makes it even more complicated. And uh, you're more, he's even then more prone to low blood pressure. Uh, and we were able to determine that by looking at these, uh, the, the, the concentrations of dis different substances, the urea, nitrogen, and creatinine in his eye fluid. You could say he was clearly very dehydrated. You can tell by looking at them too. So, so you talked about what the body is going through in terms of what's happening with internal organs. Outwardly, what is what is the body going through? What what signs are are there for a person who's having regular contact with a, with a person who is either on a hunger strike or denied access to food? Well, obviously, uh, he's losing a lot of weight. He's gaunt. Uh, you're you're going to see that. You're going to see uh, mark and diminish. But they'll be they'll be weakened. Uh, that they're. Um, uh, they're, they're, they're just their whole body, they, they have a, a, a large, a, a vastly weakened state. Muscles begin, are, are, are in atrophy, uh, and their ability to, to, uh, to do, you know, to, to walk long distances, to do anything is, is really markedly diminished. When you talk about muscles atrophy, what, explain what that is. Yeah, and atrophy just means that if your muscles, especially if they're, you know, they're, they're going to start wasting away as well your body will start breaking down muscle to try and gain energy, uh, which then is counteractive as well. Um, if you're having regular contact with a person who's going through this process, are those signs going to be readily apparent? Yes. Um, I want to show you what's been previous, and, and I think I had an opportunity to see at least one of these photographs this morning. I want to show you what I believe are people's 36A and B. Again, out of respect for Timothy Ferguson, these aren't up on any monitors or anything, but if you could take a look at people's 36 A and B, I think you looked at A this morning. And those are photos taken apparently by Paul Ferguson and sent to the defendant in this case approximately three weeks before Timothy, was, uh, Timothy passed away. The, the, what you're looking at in those pictures, is that consistent with a person going through what you've described here today in terms of emaciation and weight loss? It is. They are. Uh, clearly, you can see all the bony prominences. You can see his ribs. His face is gaunt. Uh, he's lost the, even the, you know, the fat around his eyes. Um, they appear sunken. 
uh, that is consistent with what one would see. And, and the legs, so is, is there some yes. evidence there in the legs? Right, well? the, and just you could, I mean, the legs are very, very skinny because he's losing muscle, your legs primarily, you have bone, but then you have muscle, and typically fat, that's all gone, but even the muscle's starting to, to, uh, to leave as well. And there's a text message actually associated with that leg photo, is that right? Uh, yes. And because it's, this is a part of the record, if you could just read that text message again. It says, uh, also, it's no wonder he's hardly capable of standing. So would that tend to support what you've indicated today, that there are some outward obvious physical signs that Timothy Ferguson was going through, at least on June 13th, which was three weeks before he died? Yes, he'd be, he'd be very weak. Now, Mr. Johnson asked you about uh, those records from 2019. Um, and I think you said that height wasn't taken in 2019, so it's difficult to make an analysis of whether or not Timothy was chubby or anything of that nature in 2019. Is that, is that correct? That's correct. So without, in other words, you could be average weight, but if you're you know, on the way low side of the height scale, it's, it's more likely that you're going to appear heavier. If you're very tall, it's more likely that you're going to appear skinny, correct? Right. So you can't make a determination because you don't have a weight, uh, or you don't have a height determination from 2019, correct? I do not. Right. Um, and if you need time to review this record, that's fine. But did you also obtain some records from 2017 for Mr. Ferguson? Yes. And um, and, and again, if you need some, some time to review those, please please go ahead. But did you was there a specific cause that caused Timothy to be examined medically in 2017? This would have been now five years before he passed away. Yeah, in 2017, I recall he was brought in because he was, uh, and this was again in, in uh, I believe, Oklahoma, uh, for inappropriate weight gain was uh, the reason he was brought in at that time. So in 2017, he was brought in because he was gaining too much weight? Yes. Uh, finally, Doctor, um, Mr. Johnson asked you about the, the body going through the process of shivering as, as it goes through hyperthermia and experiences those things. With the extreme weight loss and emaciation and dehydration that Timothy Ferguson had gone to, it, is it possible to even lose the ability to shiver? It is possible. Uh, I, I think that at, at some point you're going to lose that ability to shiver. You're not going to have enough energy to shiver. But you, you still might, that might be something, it's just almost a primal thing that your body does. But when we, th when we think about shivering, we all think about you know, being out at a cold football game or being outside and we're kind of doing this and, and shaking you know, for, for extended periods of time. Uh, would that be happening with Timothy towards the end with his weight loss? Well, it, it could be, but it's also possible, it, it, it certainly could. He could be shivering, but it's also possible that he doesn't have the capacity any longer. So if he's not shivering, it's probably more, uh, uh, it's probably more alarming than if he were. Thank you. No. <laughs> always one question we just, we just can't get away from, so and this is it, the 46% thou thing. How, how, do, how do doctors determine where a person is in terms of their percentile? Yeah, right. So, um, uh, and, and there were some other heights and weights from previous events as well. But they, they take, if they have a, 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 a child, right. typically the, the growth, growth charts are used for children. Right. They will measure their height and that, that gets plotted on there. Like uh -huh. for this specific age, uh, they weigh this much. And then there's one for the height as well. Okay. So even though you didn't have the height, whoever would have given you that information that it was 46 percent, if he followed or she followed the procedure, they would have had the height and they would have the weight and that's how they came to the 46 percent. Is that correct? The 46 percentile is purely for his weight. Okay. Okay. He's in the 46 percentile for his weight. Okay. Uh, and so that's why uh, at the time of his death, he was in the 60th percentile for his height. So he's okay. above average for his, for his height. Uh, but he was less than one percentile for his weight. Oh. So you, there, there's two okay. different factors there. So at the time he passed, he was above average for his height. Yes. And at the time, 2019, we didn't know what his height was. We just know he was right around that 50% mark 
for his weight. For his weight. Thank you. If I can just clear that up, and I think I can do it with one question. Yep. It, it sounds like what you're saying is that the determination of the weight percentile and the height percentile are conducted independently of each other. They are. So, in other words, you look at every you look at every child with a weight, whatever that weight is, that's where the child for, falls, regardless of the height and vice versa. Correct. Any follow up to that, Mr. John? No, sir. All right, uh, Mr. Weaver, can you grab the jury questions, please? <clears throat> right, Mr. Roberts. All right, doctor, uh, we have one question. It says, how long does it take to go from 46% uh, to 0%? Good, yeah, great, good question. Um, I would say that that is likely, um, uh, if, if there's no food whatsoever, uh, it, it, not some sprinkled in there, it's still going to take uh, many, many weeks and likely some months to get to that point. But uh, if there's, you know, that, that and, and that is they've done some studies on weight loss percentage in prisoners who have gone on hunger strikes and they lose about, uh, I, I think it was like 18% uh, of their weight per a certain amount for, you know, per, per uh, month or uh, along those lines. And I better not quote that exactly, but, but it, it was a prolonged period of time, okay? Uh, and, but yet, if there's food interspersed in there, that's going to change that somewhat. Any thought that? that. Yeah, it, it's, so you're saying with, with complete denial of food, in other words, no nutrition whatsoever, you're talking about a matter of at least weeks, if not months. Correct. And if food is interspersed in there, I'm guessing it doesn't shorten that time period, it extends it. Yes. No question. Uh, Dr. Young, I, I do have one question. Does that change uh, with water? Does that make a difference? So you're, you're saying absolutely no food whatsoever would take weeks or months? Well, right. So they're, they're drinking water, yes, in those okay. scenarios where there was no food ingested, but they still were taking water. If you're not drinking water at all, you die much quicker. That's days. Okay. All right. Any thought to that question? No. All right. Uh, Thank you, Dr. DeYoung. Uh, you can stand down. May this witness be excused, Mr. Uh, Roberts. Yes. And Mr. Johnson. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Have a good day. Uh, any additional witnesses, Mr. Roberts? Uh, I have no additional witnesses at this time. I would, uh, I, I believe that they have all been admitted by stipulation, but I would move for the admission of people's one through, I believe it's 45. Yes, 1 through 45. Okay. Uh, any, I'm, I'm assuming there's no objection, Mr. Johnson. We've stipulated, Your Honor. Okay. Okay. Back to people All right. Uh, I think it's a good time to take It's a little early for a morning break, but given the transition from the defense side, I think we'll go ahead and take a 15-minute break. Uh, come back here at 10.15, please. Ready to go. Please rise. You may be seated. Uh, 
record should reflect the jury is now secure in the jury room. Anything for the record before we uh, recess, Mr. Roberts? Sure. Yeah, Mr. Johnson. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, we, we would be bringing the motion when we return. Okay. Uh, therefore, we'd ask the jury not be brought in okay. prior to hearing the motion. Okay. Um, I'm assuming, is there any statements you wish to put on the record when we return regarding uh, your clients? I, I don't know if she's desiring to testify or not, but certainly um, do you wish to make some statements or question her regarding that decision when we come back? That that would be appropriate. Okay. I, 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 to answer the first question, yes, I intend to call her to testify. Okay. But I would ask the court to inform her of her options. Okay. All right. We will do that. Thank so you. So we are in recess. Thank you.
You may be seated. Right, we're back on the record in 23110 FC, People versus Shonda Vanderhark. Jury is secured the, in the uh, jury room. Mr. Johnson, I believe you have a motion for the court. Yes, sir. Uh, at this point, we would move for a directed verdict of not guilty, Your Honor, uh, on, on two bases. Uh, the, the first basis is, uh, and my notes indicate, and, and uh, talk to my staff here, that the proper jurisdiction has not been set in this matter. While the court has received information as to the, the, the uh, address of, of this home, uh, we don't think it's ever been established that this, this particular home is in Muskegon County or within the jurisdiction of this court. Uh, we recognize that the folks from North Shore responded, but there was still, I don't think, any testimony from any witness saying this was within the court's jurisdiction, uh, according to our notes. So we move that it be uh, dismissed on that basis. Secondly, we were moving that it be dismissed on the basis that a reasonable person could not find guilt in this matter, uh, that the testimony is, is virtually unanimous, that uh, my client uh, 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 does not perform any of the, the conduct which which would lead a reasonable person to believe that she's the one responsible for this. Uh, all these actions, uh, even taken to the prosecutors, uh, uh, best life of the prosecutors, were performed by Paul Ferguson and not my client. Uh, that uh, my client, uh, quite frankly, and, and the testimony indicates that she held Paul back from doing some other things that he wanted to do, uh, and therefore she is not the one responsible for, for this uh, this homicide. Uh, furthermore, the, the there's indication that there's food in the home. There's indication that she kept food in the home, that she's responsible for that. There's further indication by the fact that uh, uh, the, those individuals under her care, uh, which would be Paul and the, the younger son, G, were uh, of healthy mind and body. Uh, given all those factors, we don't believe there's enough for a reasonable person to find guilt in this matter. We'd ask the be a directed verdict to that effect. Thank hey, you. Mr. Roberts. Thank you. First, as it relates to the jurisdictional issue, Your Honor, I, I asked at least three different witnesses if the 4788 Marshall was in the city of North Shores County, Muskegon, State of Michigan, to my recollection. Um, Officer Stefanich, I believe the Officer Pisky, and certainly Lieutenant uh, Hooksom uh, all testified to the effect that that, your, that location was in the city of North Shores County, Muskegon, State of Michigan. So I, I think that, that argument is without merit. As it relates to the uh, other portion of the argument here, I, I understand this is a motion that Mr. Johnson does need to make, but I think there is ample evidence here from which a reasonable juror could conclude that Ms. Van der Ark had at least one of the states of mind requisite for a murder charge here, uh, whether or not she had the intention to kill. Uh, on a personal level, I hope she didn't have the intention to kill. I, if you were going to kill somebody, I, I, I would hope you would do it a lot faster and a lot less torturous than the way that this was done. Um, but she certainly did have a requisite state of mind to form the intent necessary to do either great bodily harm or to create a situation uh, where great bodily harm was the natural result of, of her actions here. As to whether or not she actually physically did any of the things that were alleged to have happened here, uh, Paul's testimony alone as well as the text messages established that she was not just the person who directed that these things to be done and, and you don't get to use as a defense, well I just said to do these things and somebody else did them. Uh, that alone is a basis for to find that she is complicit in this charge, uh, but also that she actively participated in a number of these things. Paul repeatedly testified that if he didn't administer the punishments, that she would administer those punishments, uh, that it was essentially an effort between both of them at the times when she was at work and he would not be at work. If she was at work, he was at home, he was responsible. If he was at work and she was at home, then she was responsible for doing these things. There's also been testimony from Paul that, that Timothy was in the ice bath after uh, the, the, the ice bath right before he died, uh, and that Shonda is the one that was actually administering the ice bath at that point, and the text message about dragging him back into the small room uh, sent to Paul, that was one of the last text messages that we have on July 5th, the day before, the morning, essentially the night before Timothy uh, passes away and is discovered the next morning. Uh, so again, I understand that the motion needs to be made to preserve certain appellate issues here, but I would indicate to the court that there is ample evidence for this court to that Ms. Van der Ark had one of the requisite states of mind to commit a murder in this charge, as well as evidence that she did engage in the infliction of emotional or mental or physical harm, serious physical or serious emotional harm on a child, which is the basis of the child abuse first degree. Right, thank you, Mr. Roberts. Mr. Johnson, uh, Mr. Roberts has indicated that his recollection is that the at least three witnesses uh, established jurisdiction for the court in terms of, of where this happened. Your response to that? Your Honor, it, 
as the court is aware, a lot of things are going on while we're we're, we're doing the, these matters. But I I I canvass my, my staff here, and we don't recollect <clears throat> that those that phrase was used. We we recollect that the address was used. However, we don't recollect that it was noted that it was in Northern Shores or that it was in the county of Muskegon. That's the phrase I think that offers the court this jurisdiction in this matter, and that's it doesn't reflect that in our notes. So, and, it's, and quite frankly, it's one of the things we check off as, as we do a trial like this. So, uh, from our recollection, uh, we don't see it, and we leave the court to its recollection. Okay. Um, well, first and foremost, as to the jurisdiction of the court, uh, I don't know if it was used in the exact terminology that Mr. Roberts indicated, but my recollection independently is that jurisdiction had been established through one or more of the witnesses. Um, now, Mr. Johnson, if you if if you prefer the court to review the record, I'm happy to do that. Uh, my independent recollection is that jurisdiction was established through one or more of the witnesses, but I'll I'll leave it to you. Uh, what you like the court to do? Judge, we're satisfied with the court's recollection. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the court is going to deny the directed verdict as to, on, on that basis, the motion for directed verdict. Uh, as both parties know, uh, pursuant to case law, a directed verdict of acquittal is appropriate only if considering all of the evidence in the light most favorable to the prosecution. No rational trier of fact could find that the essential elements of the crime charge were proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, it's a site taken right from People v. Mihal, which is 454 Mish 1, uh, 1997 case. That case, as well as uh, those cases before it, indicate that uh, the court is not permitted to make any sort of credibility determination uh, in deciding a motion for a directed verdict. Uh, so although Mr. Johnson did um, somewhat attack Mr. Ferguson's credibility, the court cannot make a judgment call in regards to credibility. Uh, based on the evidence that the courts heard so far, uh, the courts cannot find that, uh, that no rational trier of fact, that's really what it comes down to is essentially can any person, any rational trier of fact, and there has been enough evidence at least presented by the prosecution, taking that evidence in light most favorable to the prosecution uh, that a rational trier of fact could find in this case, the essential elements of the crimes charged, specifically uh, open murder, which could be first degree felony murder, as well as second degree murder, as well as child abuse in the first degree, uh, were proven beyond a reasonable doubt. So based on that finding, the court is going to deny the motion for a directed verdict. Uh, anything else on that, Mr. Roberts? No, no, no. Mr. Johnson? No, sir. All right, now Mr. Johnson, my understanding is your client intends to testify, is that correct? That is our intention, Your Honor, yes. All right, and I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, and I know you very well, and, and uh, you've, you've spoken to her about this decision, is that correct? Yes, sir. And, and how many times would you say you've spoken to her about this? Uh, virtually, well, we, we've discussed it for months, and okay. we came to the conclusion at least a month ago, uh, and we've had, I think, three conversations. Uh, and in the jail to this okay. effect, and then again during the course of this trial. All right, Ms. Vander Ark, uh, do you understand that you have a Fifth Amendment right not to testify? Yes, sir. Uh, a, the jury would be instructed that if you did not testify, that they could not use that against you. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. Uh, have you had an ample opportunity to talk to your attorney, Mr. F uh, Johnson, about that decision? Yes, sir. And you feel you have enough information to make an informed, intelligent decision? Yes, sir. And um, are you choosing to testify? Yes, sir, I am. All right. Any questions, uh, the court, that you wish to inquire about the defendant, Mr. Roberts? No, thank you. Mr. Johnson? No, sir, thank you. All right. Please have a seat. Anything before we bring the jury out, Mr. Roberts? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Johnson and I just discussed briefly, um, as I had indicated to the court, uh, that before even the jury selection process, we discussed the two videos, which were sort of a late discovery, and discussed uh, under which circumstances I would use those. And I indicated at that time that the court adopted the, the, the finding here that the second video, which I'll refer to essentially as the 911 video, um, would be something that I would be seeking to use, uh, certainly if Ms. Maynard chose to testify, and it now does appear that she would do so, whether or not it's played during her testimony or played as part of my rebuttal case, that I would certainly do that. So I anticipate being able to do that. Um, and the other, the, the second 
video, the one that we, we also discussed that I had indicated I, my, my choice is I do not want to show that video to the jury um, regardless of any discovery issues that may exist in the case. However, because Ms. Vander Ark is going to testify, I do think it's, it's necessary for me to ask questions about that, and part of that might involve showing maybe just her the video. I would not show it for, for the whole jury, but, if, if, but I think I would have a right to ask her questions because it is the last time that she had contact with Timothy before he died. And I think I have an opportunity to ask her under the circumstances, but also because it goes directly to refute statements that she made to the police about how she discovered Timothy and what she had done with him the night before. Um, my intention would be to not play that video again for the jury, but if Ms. Rainer Ark is unable to answer the question because she doesn't recall or makes a, an, an inconsistent statement, I certainly do envision a scenario where, where that is played, if not, if, at least for her, and then if not for the jury, if, if we get to that point. If that happens, Mr. Johnson and I have discussed, there's some younger members in the audience today, I would, <laughs> that person should be out of the courtroom if, if, if that happens. It's, it's that disturbing. Uh, but it's, that's not my call to make, but Mr. Johnson and I have discussed that as a potential. All right, well, I, and I just want to understand, so you're, you, you would intend to use it potentially to refresh your recollection? Potentially, or, or, or a prior inconsistent statement, perhaps. I can, I can envision a number of different scenarios. It starts with me asking her the question. I, I understand that. I understand that, that in order to, to challenge a person's recollection or to refute a, with a prior inconsistent statement, you have to confront them with what has taken place first. And I fully intend to explore that as a line of questioning and cross-examination with Ms. Vanguard. Um, as it relates to whether or not I need to actually play the video, a lot of it just depends on what her response is to that. I'm certainly not going to play it. As a, it, it if, if she gets up and acknowledges that she did and said the horrible things that she does, then I don't think there's a need, there certainly isn't a need to play that for the jury, and the court rules would not allow that because she's adopting essentially that she did make those statements and take those actions, and it would not be appropriate to play that for the jury because it would be done only to essentially to, to inflame the jury, and, and the evidence would have already come in. But, I, but it's grounds for cross-examination. Uh, and, and again, whether or not even she sees that video, depends on what her response is to the question. Mr. Johnson. Your Honor, thank you. And, and for, for purposes of this conversation and for, for a possible appellate record, I'm going to refer to the two videos. There's one while uh, 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 Timothy is still alive, and there's one after he's deceased. It's the one while he's still alive that we've agreed that we wouldn't enter into evidence. Uh, uh, there, there is no agreement uh, in terms of limiting uh, uh, Mr. Roberts, in terms of his ability to, as he described it, uh, to cross uh, unless there's a specific court rule. So we're not objecting to that. In theory, uh, we'll see what the circumstances are, what questions are being asked, and then determine at that point uh, if we want to object to its use even for that purpose. As for the purpose, the, the post-death uh, video, that video is the one that we've agreed uh, can be admitted if, if he cho chooses to do so. I would still have concerns about that video being played in open court. Uh, there, there, there are ways we can get around that, but, but certainly uh, ne neither of these videos I think are appropriate for, for people who don't know they're coming and who haven't agreed to, to, to watch this stuff. This is just difficult for both of them to watch. So what, I'm, what I'm saying is I'm, I'm trying to agree with, with most of what Mr. Roberts said. Uh, we'll, and I think we may be, while we're appropriate, in, talking about it now, I think that the, the, the final determination probably would be governed by the facts on the ground at the time he attempts to, to, to use them. So uh, I, we want the court to be aware of those issues, uh, but I, I would ask at this point to withhold any rulings until such time as, as the materials are, are presented for evidence. Okay. Uh, and maybe I was mistaken. It was my understanding that the first uh, pre-death video was never going to be admitted, Mr. Roberts, is that? I, and and that's, that is still my intention, Judge, okay. but I, I guess the, the, so there's always an out with a lawyer, right? I guess the only, the, the, the only caveat to that is I don't know what Ms. Vander Ark is going to testify to when I ask her the questions about that. Um, I, and I don't, I don't think the fact that, that we've made that agreement or that there might be some discovery issues there gives her carte blanche to get on the stand and lie about what took place. Um, so my, my hope would be that she would just answer the questions truthfully and honestly about what, what is on that video, and then it, I, then it doesn't even need to be shown to her. If she needs her recollection reflect, re re refreshed about what took place, or if she makes a prior inconsistent statement about that, 
I think I still have an ability to confront her with that prior inconsistent statement, and I think I can do that without even playing back for the jury as well to see if that changes her testimony. But if she absolutely refuses to acknowledge that what we all see on that video is what actually took place, I think that is, that is, a, that is a scenario here where she doesn't get to just get up there and say that, that this didn't happen. Um, so so that, that's what my concern is. And I think that's what Mr. Johnson's alluding to when he's indicating that we really need to have to have a determination of the facts and circumstances at the time, and I'm happy to take a break at that point. When we get to that point, to, to have the jury excused, and we can really drill down a little bit more on that particular issue. But I don't want to play that video for the jury. I do not want to play that video for the jury. And Mr. Johnson's correct about the other video. We did discuss that, and I think there, there's certainly some evidentiary value in playing that, or, or at least asking Ms. Van Art questions about that. And it is likely that at the conclusion of that, I may recall one of the officers to just admit that video because there is some independent evidentiary value as it relates to that because it goes directly to statements that she made to the police at the time about the discovery of Timothy and how things happened. Um, so, so that one I don't think we have much of a disagreement about. And, and again, the, the concerns about folks in the audience seeing or hearing some of those videos I think can be addressed when we get to that point. Uh, so I guess that's my position. The first video, I don't want to play it for the jury, but I can see one narrow path here, and that all depends on Ms. Van der Ark, that that becomes something that the jury actually has to see. If that happened, I would not play it for the gallery. Mr. Johnson, I just want to be under... So what Mr. Roberts is saying is that he, he envisions a... at least a, a, some sort of instance where the pre-death video could be played. And my understanding of what you're saying is that you're acknowledging that possibility. Is that correct? No, sir, it's not. My, my recollection is what the course recollection is that that video is not going to be played regardless and, and that on the circumstance, given, and given what he's already said, it's just too prejudicial and given the fact that it was given late. So my recollection is that we wouldn't play that for uh, as an evidentiary piece under any circumstances. The, the part where I'm agreeing with Mr. Roberts is, is, is if my client needs to recollections reflect refreshed or there's another legal basis to for her to see it uh, that's not part of any agreement that part uh, it, as long as there's an evidentiary requirement or, or rule or, or that, that allows him to do that then, then that's still on the table we didn't have any, we didn't have any discussions of that issue and certainly he's not bound by something he didn't agree to but I do believe the parties did agree that that that, that the, the first video the pre-death video would not be used as the evidentiary piece that presented to the jury under any circumstances, and that's I, that's our position at this point. Okay, Mr. Roberts. Your Honor, I, I will I'll accept whatever ruling the court wants to make here, obviously, and, and, and do that with with respect here. But again, this all depends on Ms. Vandor. Well, hold on, Mr. Roberts. Listen, yeah. my my recollection of our discussion yes. was simply this. There was two videos turned over very late by the city of Norton Shores Police Department. That was not the prosecutors, did not have it in their position or their possession. And as a result, those are not turned over until, I believe, last Friday, correct? Yes, well, call me on Thursday and we okay. saw them on Friday. So the pre-death video was one of those videos. There was a discussion about potentially adjourning this trial. And the, the people's position at that time was, if the court is simply going to adjourn it based on the possible admission of that video, then we would rather agree to simply keep it out. That way this trial could proceed this week. That was my recollection. Sure. I'd say that's accurate, yes. Okay. So I, I people, I'm, listen, these are agreements that we make. Um, but Mr. Johnson is saying is essentially, if I now allow that in, that creates a real issue for him, I would think, Mr. Johnson, that... Uh, well, wait a minute, if this would have gotten in or under any circumstances whatsoever, then I, he would have asked for an adjournment. Am I correct by that, Mr. Johnson? You're correct, Your Honor. So, based on us moving forward, I want to make sure, I understand you're saying, well, I'm, I'm putting it on you, Judge, but I'm going to hold people to their agreements. And my understanding was that the, that was the agreement of the two attorneys. Is that, that correct? That, that is what we agreed to, Judge. And again, I, I, I guess maybe I, maybe... Maybe there could have been a little bit better clarity. I will accept that as the court's ruling because, again, it's my preference to not play this video. Uh, and, and, and I am perfectly willing to accept at this point that I have the opportunity to, at a minimum, ask Ms. Van Dart questions about it. And then if she's, if she's unable to recall those events or if, she, or, or if she provides an inconsistent statement, that I can certainly confront.
confront her with those without presenting that, that to the jury. No. That's acceptable. I think you're not objecting to that, Mr. Johnson. You're saying, listen, if it's being used as a non-evidentiary tool to refresh recollection or something like that, you don't have an objection to that, but in terms of evidence being admitted to the trier of fact, which is the jury, you have an objection to that. That's correct. Okay, so I'm going to make a ruling right now. It's not going to be shown as an evidentiary piece that's based on the agreement uh, between the parties, um, part of the agreement to not adjourn this trial. Uh, it can be used for other purposes, certainly, but it cannot be admitted to the jury uh, as a piece of evidence. But obviously the post-death video, as we discussed, uh, was essentially fair game. I think, Mr. Johnson, you'd agree with that, correct? Yes, sir. That okay. Was, yeah. And Mr. Roberts, you'd agree with that, too, yes, correct? Yes, Okay. All right. All right. Good enough. Uh, any other issues, Mr. Roberts? No, sir. Mr. Johnson? No, sir, and thank you. All right. Uh, let's bring the jury in. Please rise. For the young man in the courtroom, uh, he was asked to leave, and I don't know why he's back in here, ma'am. Well, if I clarify, just for that or the whole time, so that could be on my own. Okay. Well, this is this is going to be very sensitive information, and um, I don't think it's appropriate for, quite frankly, anyone. But uh, we are adults in here. I don't believe this person is older than 18, and I'm not going to allow uh, a young man to be exposed to this. So, ma'am, I'm going to ask that you, if he's old enough to be left in the hall alone, you certainly can. You certainly can stay. Uh, if he's not, then I'd have to ask you to step out. You understand? Okay, thank you. Yeah. You may be seen it. All right, Mr. Johnson, you can call your first witness. Your Honor, uh, the defense calls uh, Mr. Vander Vanderhaak. All right, Mr. Vanderhaak, if you can come around here, please. Stand in front of that chair. Raise your right hand, please. Raise your right hand, please. In this matter now pending, do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? I do, yes, sir. All right, you can put your hand down, grab a seat. Please state your name for the record, spelling your first name and last name. Uh, Shonda, S-H-A-N-D-A, Vander Ark, V-A-N-D-E-R, space, capital A-R-K. Ah, thank you, Ms. Vander Ark. Uh, uh, you're being called to testify in your own cases. You understand that? Yes, sir. And, and to do that, you have to make sure that everyone can understand you, correct? Yes, sir. With you uh, and knowing you as I do, I don't think volume's going to be a problem with you? Probably not, sir. Talking fast, maybe? Yes, sir, it might. Okay, so... This is, uh, are you nervous? Yes, sir. This is stressful? Yes, sir, very. So you're going to be, questions going to be thrown at you uh, fast and furious. You, you've seen how trials work, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And <clears throat> under those circumstances, you may speed up again as I do. Yes, sir. Okay. You, you may be reminded from time to time to slow down just a little bit. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Let's make sure everyone understands you. You've been sitting through this this. This trial for the since the beginning, correct? Yes, sir. And you were arrested for these offenses alleged back when? July seventh of twenty twenty two. Okay. So you've been living with this thing for more than what, eighteen months? Seventeen months, yes. Seventeen sir. months. So you know what we're talking about, correct? Yes, sir. And you understand the allegations against you? Yes, sir. And and that it also helps that, that you have a legal background, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, uh, the things they said about how well, you did in school and, and all those things. Were all those all true? 
Uh, yes, sir. Okay, I, I, I'm not just sitting there and regaling this, but, but the things about cum laude and going to law school, all that stuff is true. It was magna cum laude, yes, sir. Okay, thank you. All right, <clears throat> let's start, let's go back to the very beginning. Uh, when you, it, okay, <clears throat> when did Timothy come to your care? Uh, May of 2021. Prior to that, who had physical and legal custody of Timothy? My ex-husband. Okay. And when he sent, and, and how, how did it happen that you ended up with custody there? My ex reached out to me um, stating that Timothy was, he could no longer handle him, that he was pushing his buttons, and that he needed to send him to live with me. Okay. And you agreed to that? Yes, sir. Okay. Had you ever lived with Timothy uh, for... During his, his when he was younger, yes. Sir. Okay. All right. So, uh, you you agreed to accept him into your home. Yes, sir. And who was living in your home at the time? Myself, my husband Adam, Paul Ferguson, and then my little man, G. G. Okay, that's what we've been Sorry. calling G. Correct. It's really hard to do. Yes, sir. Okay. Do the just do the best you can. Uh, okay. So they're all living in your home, and then Timothy joins you. Correct. Yes, sir. When Timothy's joining you. Did your ex-husband ever make any ex any effort to transfer legal custody to you? Um, we discussed it, but he never did actually sign anything, no, sir. Okay. And without legal custody, how do you get Timothy into school? You can't. And without legal custody, how do you get medical treatment for Timothy? You can't. Did your husband at least send his... I assume he had medical insurance for Timothy. Did he, he send that? He did not send me. I requested his medical uh, card, his insurance card, and he never sent it to me. Now, you heard the testimony uh, that Timoth Timothy saw the doctor in 2019. Did you hear that? Yes, I did. That was a year before you received him? Two years before I received him. <clears throat> two years before. So in the prior two years before you received him, as far as you know, based on what you heard here, your ex-husband never took him to the doctor? As far as I know, yes, sir. How do you know if he had medical insurance for this young man? He told me he did. Okay. But he never sent it to you? No, sir. Okay. Um, what was your What was your financial situation once Timothy arrived and your husband had a stroke? After the stroke, we yes. lost my husband's income, um, and it was... <clears throat> paycheck to pay, not even paycheck to paycheck, almost everything was paid late. Um, I was struggling. I, I asked Paul for help with groceries sometimes because we were struggling. Okay. And Paul was working full time? He was working part time. He's working at, at Applebee's? At yes, the, sir. Okay. So he's working part time. And so what, were you receiving any child support? No. So the entire financial burden was on you? Correct. Could you have, could you have, um, uh, afforded um, daycare for any of your children? Absolutely not, no. And could you have uh, um, afforded any extra expenses other than the ones that you were providing for? No. What type of expenses were you able to provide for this family? Just basic living expenses. Rent? Yes, sir. Uh, utilities? Yes, sir. Um, uh, food? Yes, sir. Okay, that leads to the next question I have for you. You, you had monitors and, and cameras in your home, is that correct? Yes, sir. And the impression from the, from the testimony I heard is that it was for the purpose, the sole purpose of ensuring that Timothy could not get the food. Was that, is that accurate? No. Why did you have all those monitors and cameras in your home? When Timothy came to live with us, his stepmother informed me that um, they had had motion sensors. Um, they weren't as tech savvy as I was. I worked in tech, before law school, I worked in tech support for several years. Um, but they had motion sensors because, she, and she told me that she didn't sleep at night. She only slept when he was at school because he was into everything. And so, because my, my younger child, he used to, when he was about two, he would take all his clothes off. So we started putting a camera in his room. And then once we moved to the Marshall Road uh, location, it was bi-level. My husband was born with a disability. Um, my husband was wheelchair bound, so he would. We had an extra wheelchair that we kept on the upper level. That's where the master bedroom was. Um, but that way, if the, if little man, if G was down in his bedroom, 
my husband could talk to him through the camera and have him come up. It was much easier. My husband could crawl down the steps before the stroke, but he didn't, we didn't want him to have to crawl up and down those steps. Okay. Uh, <coughs> and, and again, let's go back to the issue of food. Was food the only reason why you felt you had to monitor Timothy, or were there other issues? There were plenty of issues, sir. So, well, well first of all, the, what we've heard some testimony as to uh, Timothy's special needs. What were his special needs? He was on the autism spectrum, but he was completely verbal, and he was grade level in school. He was not behind in school at all. Um, he was diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. He was diagnosed as bipolar and sensory processing disorder. Um, I heard Paul mention physical disability. He didn't have any, now, Timothy, when he first got there, said he had a physical disability, and I asked his, his stepmom about it to make sure, and she said, no, he's, he was not coordinated at all. Um, the first summer that he lived with us, my youngest was playing baseball, and Timothy actually mentioned, because we had planned to put him in public high school, I'm gonna try out for the baseball team, and I didn't say anything to him, but I remember thinking, sorry, sweetie, there's no way, you don't have the coordination for that. All right. Uh, and he, he liked uh, to take, well, you tell me, did, did he like to take things apart? Oh, yes, absolutely. Can you He's, give some examples? Um, he took batteries apart, he took toys apart, my, my youngest son's toys. Um, he, if he could get a hold of anything from Paul's room, he would take like, mostly it was Legos. Paul still had Legos. Um, <coughs> he, at one point, um, messed with our water heater. What do you mean? Uh, he actually turned the gas off to the water heater. Um, he, he knocked out the pilot light and then turned the gas off as well at different points. Okay. Were you, did you have any concerns as to whether or not this, his, his predilections, his, his desire to get into things, might be a safety hazard for either him or somebody else in the home? Extremely, I was extremely concerned about that, yes sir. So it is. it was your desire to, it was it just your desire to monitor Timothy or did you, did you also have a younger child in the home that you wanted to monitor? Uh, we had both. Okay, was it, well who, who did you want to monitor? One or the other or both? Both. Okay, all right. So you set up these, these video and audio cameras, correct? Yes sir. Okay. Uh, and alarms on the doors? On Those didn't get installed until about three weeks before he passed away. Okay. And uh, motion sensors? Yes, sir. Okay. He got around the motion sensors multiple times. Were you able to Were you able to stay home and personally monitor your children? No, I had to work full time. Okay. Uh, how were you? Were you able to get specifically? Were you able to get Timothy into school? No, we were not. We tried to, to enroll him in Mona Shores High School, and um, Mona Shores told me that my ex, I guess Timothy had damaged a Chromebook in Oklahoma, and because my ex owed money on that, they would not send his records up to us. So we were not able to enroll him. So I found an uh, online homeschool curriculum that I had to monitor, but I, I enrolled him in that. Let me make sure I understand. Was it your original intention to put Timothy into public schools? Yes, sir. We okay. started the process. I filled out the paperwork. Um, because of my work schedule, I couldn't actually take paperwork to Mona Shores. My, my husband did that. Adam did that. Um, but yes, we did try to, to get him enrolled. Okay. And the youngest child, G, was he in public schools? No, he was homeschooled. What about Paul? Do you know if he was homeschooled or if he, when he got to you, was he still in school? No, he had graduated high school. Okay. All right. Um, Okay. Now, you, you mentioned that you weren't able to stay at home and and uh, uh, care for your children at home, in the home, um, as, as a stay-at-home parent. Is that correct? That's correct. And um, <clears throat> what what type of, I assume you're in the, out working? Yes, sir. Okay. Ex explain to, to the jury the work that you did during the period of time that Timothy arrived in your home. I was... When, when he first arrived, I was still studying for the bar exam, so my husband was working full time, um, and I was just doing, uh, I, I trained dogs on the side, everything from basic obedience up through different types of service dogs for other people, and so I had a couple of dog training clients, but mostly I was studying for the bar exam. I also was an intern here in this courthouse. That, that paid time. a lot of money? Oh, it was, it was not paid at all, sir. Okay. Um, but uh, it was... The week of the bar exam, um, my actually my, my judge that I worked for here as a law clerk, 
informed me of this position that was opened in Waco County, and she knew that the judge referred me, and that's when I did the interview, and, and I started work, I think it was three days, two days after I completed the bar exam. Okay. Was that a paid position? Yes, it was. Was, was it lucrative enough where you didn't have to do any other work? Um, well, with my husband's income, it was. Okay. But your husband's income stopped when he, when he got sick? When he had the stroke, yes. Okay. So at that point, was it enough income to provide for you and your family? No. Were you receiving any other outside income? <clears throat> um, my um, older brother lives in the home that I, used to, that I still own in Oklahoma, and he paid rent to us. Okay. But it wasn't a lot. It was, that went towards our house rent. Child support? No. My, my ex, one of the siblings was forgotten yesterday. Um, I, there's five total. We talked about the four boys. I also have a daughter. Um, she is now 19, but she stayed down with her dad. Okay. So we each had one, so there was no, um, there was no child support. And because of child support on the, the other four kids, I actually was still paying my ex child support. It was still being deducted from my check. Okay. So you had that, that's another deduction from your income? $1,000 a month, yes, okay. sir. Okay. So um, were you also doing tutoring when, when you went to the, the judge was paying you? Were you still tutoring or doing any other outside work? Not at that. I was doing the dog training. Okay. Let, let me ask you this. What time in the morning did you leave to go to work? Um, I usually left the house about 6.30. And what time, on an average, were you getting home? About 6 o'clock. Okay. So we're talking about 12 hours away from the home? Yes, sir. Okay. Those, those, those monitors, um, uh, the video cameras in your home, you were able to, or to, re, to view them <clears throat> while at work? From my phone, occasionally, yes, sir. Okay. Um, and you were, but you were still working? Yes, sir. I didn't view them at all until after the stroke. I mean, because my husband was there, or we had we had arrangements where my husband was off certain days of the week. Paul was off one day, specifically one day a week, so he took care of, of Gabriel and Timothy. And then um, the other two days that I needed care for Gabriel when my husband was working, he actually went to my in-law's house down in West Olive. May I approach the witness for just a moment, John? You may. Uh, let's see. You you have so you have three children at home. Yes, sir. Okay. And my understanding is you, you, you faced other challenges personally in terms of your own personal health. Today. Yes, sir. I did. Okay. Uh, for instance, let, let's run down the list. You have insomnia. Severe insomnia caused by attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Okay. And and uh, for those folks who who get a great night's sleep every night, don't understand <clears throat> what insomnia does to to your ability to function. Can you explain to them what impact chronic insomnia has on a person? It limits your ability to think clearly. Um, your energy level is, is greatly reduced. Um, takes a lot longer to process things. Um, you, you forget things easier. Uh, it, was just, it was much harder to function with, with so little sleep. Okay. And you talked about your other, your other personal disorders. Were you seeking medications for those? Um, I was for, um, I had, I have severe attention deficit hyperactivity disorder combined type. Um, I also have sensory processing disorder and OCD. Um, and then after my husband's stroke, as a result of my husband's stroke, because I viewed him, I, I, I wasn't in the room when he had the stroke, but I, it was, I was there right afterwards. And so I developed post-traumatic stress disorder with disassociation from that. The only medication that I was on was for the ADHD. Okay. Uh and you had you had the service dogs in your presence to. I had one service dog for me. Yes. Okay. Sir. Um, what source of medical? What source of interventions were available for for Timothy's disorders? Um, when he came to us, he was on medication. He was on. They gave us a whole like large gallon size Ziploc bag of medications for him. Um, I could not refill them because I could not get him to the doctor. Um, we were going to try to adjust his medication because when he came to live with us. When he took his medicine, he was a zombie. It was, it was just horrific. Um, and when Paul came to live with us, because Paul had only been there a year when Timothy moved down, or moved up, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, and when Paul, he was on the same big bag of medication, um, and there were serious concerns that they just, instead of handling, especially my ex, he wanted to medicate them. But I never got that option because I couldn't take him to the doctor. Okay. All right. 
Um, there's been uh, some allegations, there's been some implications, put it that way, that you uh, tried to keep people from seeing Timothy, that you tried to keep them away from public view, that he didn't go to school, he didn't go to the doctor, etc. Then he went to, he went outside, he was in the backyard. You remember that testimony? Yes, sir. Uh, from, if, if someone's outside in your backyard, is he, are there trees or fences or other obstacles to keep the neighbors from looking over there and seeing uh, who's out in your yard? No, there was a clearing before, there was, there was woods at the back of the lot, but there was a clearing and at least the neighbors on each side, they, there were pretty sizable windows on the back of their homes. Mm -hmm. um, they weren't in the, I think the next door was a two level, but the one on one side was just a, a single level, it may have had a basement, I don't know. Um, but there was big windows and they could see into our backyard easily. Okay. Um, was it ever your intention to keep people from seeing Timothy? No, my mother-in-law saw him. We had a, they do rental home inspections, I guess the city of Norton Shores. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember if it was late April or early May of 2022, but it was in that neighborhood. And so we'd had the inspection that day and my mother-in-law happened to stop by that day. And I invited her in, we, we sat and talked and Timothy wanted to come say hi. So he, he came up and said hi to her. Um, now, you're, you're a uh, Muskegon County transplant, correct? You're, you're, yes, you're, I'm not okay. from around here. So, and where's, and I'm assuming that your, 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 bi, your direct biological family, there's not a lot of them in this county? There's no, bi I don't have, other than my children, I don't have any biological, father, biological family here. Okay. How far away are they? Uh, my older brother is in Oklahoma City, and then I have two sisters that I have not talked to in over 20 years, and they live in Alabama where I'm from. Okay. So how, how often do those folks, your bio family, stop by and to see how sister's doing? Um, the last time I saw my older brother was when we all, we went down to North Carolina for my oldest son's wedding in October of 2021. And then my, my brother and sister-in-law drove over from Oklahoma for the wedding as well. We FaceTimed a lot. We watched football games on FaceTime, but um, I didn't get to see them after we moved up here. Okay. Do you have a lot of friends in the area that will come by, will stop by, on, uh, maybe on, does it happen to be in the area, that sort of thing, that will come by and, and, and visit your home? Most of my friends were from work, and they actually, because I worked in Nuego County, they lived in Nuego or Oceana County, or even further, I don't know, I'm not from here, I don't know what county is next to Nuego East, um, but I know at least one person from work lived in, I think it's Big Rapids. Yeah. Um, so no, they didn't stop by because they were too far away. Did you have a lot of time for social, Interactions at your home? No, not at all. And how about Paul? Did he have friends that he bring by, or? No, he talked about people at work, but he never asked to bring anybody over. Did were there any? Was he ever given any instructions? You can't have people in this house. Absolutely not. And what about uh, the youngest child, G? Did he have any friends that for sleepovers or anything like that? We didn't have any friends over for it. No, um, he had he played baseball. Um, because of me not being able to get out. He didn't get out a lot. I mean, I wish I could have gotten him out more. That's why we put him in baseball, so he could get around other kids some more. Um, I had been looking into homeschool co-ops, but with my schedule, I just couldn't do that. Okay. What, in your opinion, what, which would you say was more impactful in terms of your, you know, get Timothy out of the house? Was it, was it your desire he not get out of the house or your work requirements? Um, it was work requirements and his choice. Um, there was... I want to say it was April. The weather was halfway decent. I guess people here were, I mean, there was kids down the street. There was teenagers playing basketball when I came home from the grocery store one weekend. Mm -hmm. And I, I stopped and rolled my window down and said, hey, I've got a 15-year-old at home. Can he come play with y'all? Even though I knew he wasn't coordinated, I, knew he, I thought he would enjoy it. And they said, yeah, sure, absolutely. And he <coughs> did not want to go play. Okay. Did he ever request to go play and you denied him? No, no, he never did. Actually, Paul, we had, um, mom and dad, my, my in-laws, got Timothy a bike for his 15th birthday. And Paul and he, we were on a cul-de-sac. And um, Paul had tried to teach him to ride the bike. Um, okay. I know, I know they had a few sessions. I don't know how many. Okay. So those, on those occasions, he'd be outside? Oh, in yeah, he was out in the cul-de-sac, in front of the house. In the <coughs> okay. All right. Let's talk about some of the things that have come up in this case. Uh, there, there were, uh, okay, there, there were leg irons discovered in your home. Were you aware of those? I, I was aware that Paul had them. Um, you actually could look on my Amazon 
Paul had the option to do payment on the Amazon as well as mine, uh -huh. and Paul had actually ordered those under his, his account. Okay, you did not order the leg irons? I did not, no. Did you, did you ever use them? No, sir. No, uh, I never instructed. Let's be in specific. Did you ever use them with Timothy? No, sir. Okay. Uh, did you ever notice any uh, bruising on Timothy's wrists or legs uh, that might be attributable to the use of leg iron? No, sir. I never saw anything with that. Uh, you heard Paul talk about plastic ties. What, what was that about? I honestly don't remember. Okay. Um, I, I don't know why we would order. I mean, I saw the ties. I don't, I don't remember ordering them. Okay. I don't know what happened there. You're going to say I don't remember a lot, aren't you? Unfortunately, yes, because of the dissociation. Okay. Explain to, explain to the jury what that means. Um, well, there, I guess there's different forms. Somebody told me this. I did not find out about the PTSD and the dis disassociation until about seven months after my husband's stroke, even though it had been going on since right, the right. stroke. I need to place an objection on the record, and I think we're going to have to excuse the jury. Okay. The jury? We'll have to excuse you back to the jury room. Maybe seated. Uh, I reckon you feel like the jury is now in the jury room secure. Go ahead, Mr. Roberts. Well, for, first and foremost, Your Honor, she's not qualified to testify about what this association means and what this association is, what affects this association. Anything that she knows about that presumably would have to be told to her by a doctor. We've already been down the road. Uh, Mr. Johnson, to my, to my knowledge, has tried multiple doctors that would be able to provide a diagnosis of Ms. Van Ark to indicate that she has you know, some type of disassociation or some type of mental disorder which would have contributed to this offense and has not done so. That's an insanity defense. We covered that extensively. Mr. Johnson, I think, valiantly tried to, to get that and has been unable to, to provide any information to me from any medical doctor who's examined Ms. Van Ark that she suffers from any of these diagnoses. So I'm objecting to this entire line of questioning about disassociation, about why she can't remember certain things. Um, if she wants to say she just can't remember, I, I guess she can just say she can't remember, but she doesn't get to use the excuse that this is disassociation. Furthermore, I, ha I have a doctor still on standby as a potential rebuttal witness who did examine Ms. Van Der Ark. It's the report from the Forensic Center, which, with, which Mr. Johnson has, which essentially debunks this entire disassociation uh, uh, myth that she doesn't remember things or chooses not to remember things because of some disassociation. So I, I'm objecting to this entire line of questioning. It's an inappropriate, essentially, defense that's being raised here. It's, it sounds like it's almost like a diminished capacity type defense, which we all know is not a valid defense. Uh, and I'm not on notice of any insanity defense or any doctor would provide a diagnosis meaningful to, for the jury so they understand what these things actually are. All right, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, sir. Initially, let, let me uh, tell you what it's not. It's not an insanity defense. It is, and certainly, uh, my client can testify as to what she knows. Now, if, if she's, if the people are at liberty to examine her as to what she knows and how she might know that and, and, and determine that the, her, her sources of information aren't adequate or that her understanding is inadequate, but certainly I can ask her what she knows and what she, how, how what she knows corresponds to what's going on with her physically and mentally. Those, those do not rise to insanity defense. And certainly, if she says, I don't remember, she can explain why. If she, judge, if she were a drunk and she said, I can't remember because I was drunk that night, we would allow that in. If she says, I can't remember because it's disassociation thing, then that should be allowable. It's, it doesn't rise to a legal defense. It doesn't arise to uh, a, 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 a argument of insanity. What it does is an, it's an explanation simply of, what she did next. How did, why did you do this? Why did you do that? Why don't you remember these things? That's what this explains. And, and quite frankly, that I think is, is relevant and it's certainly, uh, I think, permissible at this point. If, if the people uh, have an expert that they can bring in and say, hey, look, that's not what's going on with this woman, that's, that's their call. 
but to say she can't even talk about it because somebody else may disagree with her is, is not the standard. The standard here is, is the, is the information relevant? And certainly, is, did she act upon it? Certainly. And she's acting upon this information, and, it explain, and does it explain an issue for which the, ju the jury has to determine? They have to determine intention. And, and quite frankly, she, if she doesn't even remember the conduct that she's involved with, certainly that goes to determine, show that she didn't make an, an informed, well, I would argue that it shows that she didn't make an informed choice to do the things that, that happened in that household. But certainly she gets a chance to explain why it is I don't remember, because that's going to be her answer. I don't remember. And so she gets a chance to explain that. And that's all we're asking here. We're not going to argue that this is a defense. It's certainly, it's just simply an explanation for why she did what she did. Mr. Roberts? Well, the problem, she can certainly answer she, she doesn't remember. Absolutely, she can answer that. What she can do is testify about a diagnosis that she says that she's been provided by somebody and an explanation for what that diagnosis means. She's not a doctor. Anything that she learned to talk about disassociation was provided to her by hearsay. And that those individuals, if, if, that was the if that is going to be the testimony and disassociation is the defense, then I want the doctor here that examined her and diagnosed her with having disassociation so she can conveniently forget the horrible things that happened in this case. It's all hearsay. It's not the same thing as intoxication. So Mr. It's Johnson, I, I think you know, you, you're going to ask her if she, she doesn't remember, assuming she's going to answer no, well, why don't you not remember? She's going to say, well, because I have this dissociation disorder, right? I think, Mr. I think you'd have to lay the foundation for that, uh, for that testimony. And the foundation for that testimony would have to come, would be hearsay, uh, would be from some other source. Um, she's obviously not a doctor. She can't self-diagnose herself. She's not been admitted as an expert. So she's, she, she can, as a lay person, testify to what she feels and those things rationally based upon her feelings and what she sees and understands. So I don't think it's an objection that she can say, you know, I don't remember. Why don't you remember? Well, because, you know, I black out. Now, your example was drunk driving. Well, a lay person can say, hey, listen, in my experience, when I drink eight beers, I, you know, stumble. I can't really remember those kind of things. And it's rationally based on her perception. And she can describe those things that are happening to her. I think that's fair. But to, in order to say, yes, that is exactly dissociation disorder or this, that has got to be a foundation laid for that. Yes, and she cannot lay that foundation. And if she's going to, again, that would be hearsay. Again, if a doctor comes in and says, we told her this, that lays the foundation, OK, fine. But I think Mr. Roberts uh, is correct when he says that foundation has not been laid, which would then implicate him bringing in a doctor to say, that's not true. So uh, based on that, I am going to sustain the objection. Again, you can still ask her about what she felt, what she heard, what she saw. The symptoms she experienced, I, I don't think you're objecting to that, Mr. Roberts, is that correct? Well, sy symptoms makes me a little bit nervous. I guess we can, we, we can address it on an answer-by-answer basis. But if she says, hey, but, look, I felt heart palpitations, or I felt my blood pressure going up, or I felt... Oh, well, certainly okay. talking about fit, physical, yeah, physical impacts on, okay. on your own body, sure, I mean, anybody okay. can testify to those things. Right. But, but tying it to any specific diagnosis is, is just inappropriate, okay. because there's, there's no foundation that supports indicating. I agree. Thank All you. right. So oh, objection oh, is uh, sustained. Uh, you understand? We can't talk about disassociation. We can't use that term. Yes, sir. Okay. Second, the judge. <laughs> and a few moments ago, I, I was given permission to, to, to approach my client. I whispered something in her ear. She was using Gabriel's name. Yeah, Mr. And, John, I did hear. Uh, Mr. Roberts caught that, that too. That yeah. yeah. So no, I didn't have. I didn't say anything then, right. and I understand. I. Okay. We've been, you know, practice. I've seen you in practice. You haven't actually practiced in front of me, yet, but. <laughs> Um, but, I, but I certainly have seen you in action, so I, I think I, I trust that you're not doing anything nefarious. So. Thank you, John. Yeah. All right. Uh, anything else, Mr. No. Roberts? No, sir. No. Okay. Let's bring him back up. Please rise.
You may be seated. Right, you may continue, uh, Mr. Johnson. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ms. Van Aert, uh, you, you've, you've told the jury about how busy you are, and you told the jury that, that you have some, some physical things going on with you, correct? Yes, sir. How did those things impact you in terms of, of your, 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 your ability to think clearly, organize, and uh, follow through on information? Starting right after my husband's stroke, um, I started experiencing episodes where if you've ever passed out, like the world closed, you get tunnel vision and the world closes in on you until you, you completely black out. It felt like I was blacking out, but I didn't actually pass out. Um, and the events that happened after that, I have no idea of what happened. I don't remember it. I, I don't know. Okay. And this happened anytime I got even a little stressed. This so, happened. so you're understanding, you're under oath right now, correct? Yes, sir. And you're asked to tell the truth right now? Yes, sir. Okay. So we're, we're asking you that you not fill in not guess at anything? Correct. That, okay, do you understand that? Yes, sir. So it is, if you don't understand, we need to say, you don't, or you don't remember, we need to say those things. Correct. Okay. Um, and and you, did, you did testify that these symptoms and this pressure impacted your recollections. So that Absolutely, correct. yes. And then there's the, the final pressure. You, you're, you're raising children and, and teenage children, uh, some of them in your home at the same yes. time. So all these things are going on at once, is that correct? Yes, sir. Um, while you're at work monitoring, and you've got the, the ability to monitor the home, uh, would your job permit you, did you have the ability to sit in front of a monitor and watch the home all the time, or did, were there times that you could not do that? Most of the time I couldn't do it. And why is that? Because I had work to do. Um, we were, part of the time I was in court with my judge, um, and then most of the time I was doing research or doing other tasks that my judge or one of the other judges in the county assigned. So I didn't, I didn't have time to do that. Uh, you're, when, when you're watching the videos on the phone, you said you watched them with your, your telephone screen, correct? Correct. And it is a standard screen, nothing special about it? It was an iPhone, I think it was a 12. Okay. Um, I've seen those video cameras where they, where systems where they, you can have four <clears throat> different cameras going all at one time, all the same screen. Was that your situation or did you move from camera to camera and only have that camera visible? No, the cameras were different brands and different cameras, so you could only do one at a time. Okay. All right. So, and were you wearing an eye watch as well? An Apple watch, yes. Apple watch. Oh, thank you. Uh, were you able to monitor your children uh, from the Apple watch? No. Okay. Uh, so, if you, were, if you were, say, in a courtroom like this and you're doing your job, you got a message on your Apple watch, which, what would you get? Um, I, you could get messages and pictures, you couldn't see it, I mean the screen was tiny, um, but you could get messages and then there's certain like pat responses, like pre-programmed responses, or you can type with your finger. Okay, I'm going to ask you about a specific uh, email or text that you received uh, that accompanied a picture. Uh, it's, it's the one that the prosecutor's given to, to, the, to the jury where that shows Timothy uh, from the chest up and then his legs. You know the one I'm talking about? I have heard about it. I have not actually seen these pictures. How could, well you respond to it. How's that come from that be? I typed on my, we were in court that day. Uh -huh. I actually think I responded. I'm in court. Um, I scribbled out a message real quick. To back okay. to Paul. Okay. So you, you, did you see the photograph afterwards? No, I had too many messages on my phone. I don't usually scroll back. Okay. So how did you know to respond to, to, to Paul to say, give him some food? Because of what he said. He had sent a message saying something. Okay. So, you were able to see the message. Yes, I saw, I saw the message. And the, the picture, I mean, it's this big, but there was pictures. I just couldn't see what it was of. Okay. Let's, and I, I deviated again. I tend to do that. Sorry about that. I need to be more organized and we'll get there. Um, we talked about the leg irons. We talked about the plastic ties. And Did you purchase those plastic ties? I don't remember, honestly. Okay. Uh, what about the hot sauce? Talk, tell this jury about hot sauce and your son Timothy. My, my under, well, I'm not going to ask you, tell you my understanding because you don't need to know that. The question is, whose idea was it to, to get hot sauce and to administer it to your son? The idea was originally Paul's. Okay. And what was the, what was the point of the hot sauce? Um, because we had tried multiple other discipline methods and he thought maybe that would get him to stop misbehaving. Okay. 
okay. he suggested it to me, and I, at that, I was so wrung out, I was willing to try just about anything. All right. Were you aware of how, that this, were you aware that this hot sauce was purchased online? Yes. Do you know why it was purchased online instead of going to Meyer and, and picking up a bottle of hot sauce? Well, I didn't go, I didn't have time to go to the store. I mean, our groceries were, I did the grocery delivery through okay. the Walmart app or through the Meyer app. Um, so, and I didn't see anything. Um, they just had basic stuff. And from our discussion, we had talked about something. And Timothy could handle this child. When I got well, pregnant. I, I, okay. I know you're going, but you're gonna, hold on a second. Okay, sorry. I, I, I want to make sure we understand this. Th this, this hot sauce has a, has a particular label. I, I've never seen it at Meyer. Did you did you see the label? Did you see the, the hot sauce itself? Did you what what did you did you order it? I believe I ordered at least one of the bottles. Yes. Okay. Why did you order this particular hot sauce or these particular hot sauces? What did they have in common? Um, because I think it was the same brand, um, the same one. Um, because it was hotter than what you could usually get, and because Timothy could he liked spicy food. Okay. He loved spicy food. All right. Uh, <clears throat> How, how do you know you like spicy food? That actually started before he was ever born. Um, before I got pregnant with Timothy, I didn't like spicy at all. I mean, I nothing, no heat, nothing. And when I got pregnant with him, I started craving. Um, my ex liked spicy foods, but I didn't, and I started craving. Like I would outspice my my ex. Um, it was amazing. Um, I still like, I, not to the extent when I was pregnant, but it, that some of that remained. But Timothy, as early as age two, he could eat a whole bag of the flaming hot Cheetos. Without a drink, I mean, just he could down. He he loved spicy food. It was okay. It used to scare the heck out of me. But you were aware that this these spices were were hotter than what you yes. could admire. Yes. Yes. And and that it was for disciplinary issues. Is that yes. correct? Did you ever? Uh, the the testimony was that you did child care while uh, Paul was at school or at work. Did you ever administer any of the hot sauce yourself? If I remember, I might have, have done some on bread a couple of times, okay. um, but usually by the time I got home, um, that either we were cooking food, I, I had to cook, or I had had Paul cook something so I could feed everybody. Um, but I don't recall, I, I think I did it on bread once or twice maybe, but that was it. There's a text out there that says, you suggested putting hot sauce on his penis. Do you remember hearing that? With the I remember hearing it, yes. Do you remember saying those things? I do not, no sir. Um, oh yeah, um, we talked. We talked about the ice baths. I'm like, some talk cold baths, and sometimes they were called ice baths. Do you remember that testimony? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, the the source of the ice, according to the testimony I heard, was your home refrigerator. No, it was actually a countertop ice maker. The refrigerator did not have an ice maker in it. Okay, and you didn't go on buy the, the fifty pound bags of ice for the home. No, I did not. How much ice are we talking about for that that that? Tabletop ice maker. It actually made about a cup and a half of ice. I had to measure it to use it for. I made some frappes at times. Okay. Um, the basket was maybe this wide, and then underneath was the water um, where the water was kept because that's how it made the ice. Okay. And then it took about two hours to remake more ice. Okay. You admit getting frustrated with uh, your child care efforts with Timothy, is that correct? Yes, sir. Um, frustrated, discouraged. Did you ever intend to hurt him? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. You, you raised other children, correct? Yes, I did. And uh, while Timmy was malnourished, do you, to your knowledge, have any of your other children ever been reported as malnourished? No, not at all. I, as I looked at Paul, he seemed uh, like a thin guy to me. He is. That's we're all very pretty small. Well, okay. other my oldest is a little bit thicker. Okay. My my question is this: Is it was Timothy's when he was healthy? Was his build like his brothers, or was is he was he built like his older brother, <coughs> who's a little heavier? He went back and forth. Um, he actually there was an, um, a situation where he actually got on the the bathroom scale in it was after Mother's Day of 2022. Um, I can tell you why I know it's after Mother's Day if you want me to. No, that's not necessary. Okay. Unless but um, I, was, I, I was training a new service dog, as has been discussed. He's a great Dane puppy. He was seven months old at the time. And 
he was too big to sit on the bathroom scale to get his weight, and I wanted to see what he weighed. And Timothy, what we would do is somebody would stand on the scale, get your weight, and then you pick up the dog. And Timothy wanted to help out that day. Um, so I, I thought the dog would be too big for him at that point. He was already really big at seven months old. But uh, I said, okay, let's try it. And so it was, like I said, sometime after Mother's Day. It wasn't very long after Mother's Day. But at the time, he was 104. Timothy was. Okay. Um, he could not pick up the dog because the dog was 102 at the time. Okay. <coughs> Part of this process of providing child care, mm -hmm. somebody had to be the eyes in the house when you weren't there. Is that correct? Yes. And you selected Paul for that purpose. I didn't have a choice. That was my only option. How much did you rely upon what Paul was telling you? I totally relied on him. Do you remember the the uh, during the reading of the uh, uh, transcripts, the, the text that you asked Paul? Matter of fact, let me. Be honest with me. Are you worried about him at all, or is it all a bunch of BS? Like it has been for days. Do you remember that? Do you remember that text? Um, vaguely, yes, sir. Okay. Do you remember his response? I remember he said he wasn't worried about it. Did you rely on that? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. He was the one. I was I was at home so few hours when the kids were awake, unfortunately. And then you had to sleep. Try to sleep yourself. I tried, yes, sir. And they slept better than I did. Let's let's face it. Your house is a mess. It's a wreck. Yes, sir. Why was that? I'm, honestly, I'm not a great person at keeping things clean, and having three boys that contributed. Um, I tried to, to get help, their help cleaning up as much as I could, but I just didn't have time, or the energy. With the lack of sleep and everything else going on, I, I barely functioned. Okay. And um, that, that, eat, that message I, well, I'll strike that, I'll need that. Did you depend, I asked you, did you depend on what Paul was telling you? Yes, sir. Your, in your opinion, did Paul ever, for lack of a better term, sound the alarm? Not I mean, that I was aware of, no, sir. Okay. Do you, that one message, was that it? That was it. That's the only thing I got from Paul that ever had any concern. With the one little pictures in it? Correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And it's, okay, let's talk about some other stuff here. Um, once, once you discovered that, that Timothy had passed, uh, and once the police get there, do you tell them the truth? No. I was so freaked out. I was, I'm sorry. I'm sleep. I've got one. I'm sorry. Thank you. You're welcome. Why didn't you tell them the truth? Why were you so freaked? I don't remember what my line of thinking was at the time. I was so tired. I don't, I don't know. I wish I had an answer for you, but I don't. Were you tired at that point? I was exhausted. I, the night before he passed, I had had less than an hour of sleep. Were you frightened at that point? Absolutely. I just lost my son. Do you need a moment? I'm okay. Okay. Um, were you expecting? Were you, were you, was this some, this outcome expected by you? Absolutely not, no. So would it be safe to say you were surprised? I was shocked. Were you in disbelief initially? Yes, absolutely. Um, we've got a, a, a there's, there's an indication that it took you a while to call the police. In fact, you told, you told uh, uh, Paul not to, according to, to Paul's testimony. Why did it take you so long? He said 18 minutes out. Why did it take you so long to call the police? I have no idea, honestly. It was, I was, I'm trying to figure out how to describe it. It was, it was surreal, like you're not even, you don't even know what's going on. It was, you just, time slowed down and I didn't know what was going on. When was the first time you found out it took 18 minutes to call the police? Um, was it yesterday or the day before? Um, yeah, it was it, within the last few days. Okay. That's the first time. Do you remember who was testifying when you found out? Um, it doesn't matter. Right. I think we discussed it at a meeting on Monday. <clears throat> um, was it Monday? Okay. I think it so. Um, but and I heard 14 minutes initially, and then the first time I heard 18 minutes was when Paul said it okay. yesterday. 
Um, do you remember? <clears throat> how clear is your memory of the of the of your time and from the time you found uh, Timothy and and he had passed, and the t to the time you finished talking to the police that day? It's spotty. Okay. Um, the, the, the first officer said that uh, 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 you were distraught. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. Uh, he said that you were crying. Do you agree with that? Yes, sir. Do you remember telling the police that you, that, uh, uh, you pulled Timothy from his bunk bed when you found him in distress? I remember saying something like that, yes, sir. Was that true? No, sir. Do you remember... Uh, providing CPR for Timothy. Yes, I do. When, when did you stop that? Um, when the ProMed people walked down into the basement. I, I, um, I had asked them to take over and they didn't take over right away, but they said I had to, to leave the area. Okay. Let's do the hard stuff here. Uh, jury's seen pictures of Timothy. We've all seen pictures of Timothy at the time of his death. How could you not know he was that ill? How could you not know? Honestly, I just, I was barely functioning. I missed a lot. There's, I mean, I hate it because, I mean, I feel like a complete failure, but there was things that I just didn't see. There was a lot that I didn't see, unfortunately. Those, on those, in those texts, you, you instruct Paul to make sure he's getting enough calories, correct? Yes, sir. I you had a restricted diet, correct? Yes, sir. But you instructed Paul to make sure he's getting calories. Yes, sir, I did. Did you rely on that? Absolutely. Um, Paul says he called the police ultimately. Who called the police? I called 911. It was on my phone. I'm sure you can <coughs> pull the call and find out where it's from. Did you intend to hurt Timothy? No, never. Did you did you know he was being hurt? No, I didn't, unfortunately. The 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 tactics that you use to uh, first of all, we're, we're, the tactics well, the tactics that you use to, to discipline Timothy. Did they seem extreme or outrageous to you at the time? No. Um do you re Timothy remained in, you'll admit it was, it, the, the bath was not warm on the day he died. It was a cold bath. Correct, the day okay. before. It wasn't an ice bath, though, correct? As I wasn't, you know. I, um, I, from the text, it looks like he did, but I, that wasn't the, what was said to do. Okay. Paul chose to do the ice on his own, if you look at the text. Okay. So, <coughs> do you, there's testimony that you remained in that tub for hours. Were you aware of that? No, I, I didn't realize he was in the tub, no. When you came home, you didn't realize he was in the tub. I did. When I got home, I actually ran him a warm bath when I got home. Okay. Where? In the tub downstairs. Okay. So once you found him in the tub, you, what did you explain to the jury what you're talking about? Um, well, I, I had to get Paul to work, and then I came home, and um, my understanding, at least, was that when Paul had splashed water, he had splashed it on his face only. That's what I understood. Um, so I didn't realize he was still there. Um, and so when he, when he, I got home, I was like, wait a second, what the, so I, I decided to go ahead and run a warm bath just to, to. There's, there's a bunch of stuff in there talk about, make sure he doesn't sleep, make sure he doesn't sleep. What's that about? Um, there was a couple of situations where he actually, Timothy actually intentionally kept everybody in the house awake. Um, he would intentionally set off the motion sensors. Um, he would make noise um, with the house being a bi level. You could hear a lot from the downstairs. Um, but he intentionally kept everybody awake. Okay. Um, and so that was, okay, if you're gonna keep us awake, then you have to stay awake. Okay, so here, here's, the, here's my question. If he slept all day, what would he do all night? Oh, he'd be up all night. There's no, he had to, you had to get him up no later than about 10 in the morning or he was, he was up all night long. Okay. Uh, there, there's a door that has a, a, a 
dent in it that we still have an exhibit of. Okay. Um, and, and you heard Paul testify that he, he did that. Yes. What is your recollection of that incident? Um, I, what I remember is I, hear, I remember hearing Paul yell from his room because his room was directly below the master bedroom. Um, and then I pulled up the, I wasn't asleep, um, so I pulled up the, the main camera in the, the basement area and I see Paul come out and kick that door. And I, I went to hit the button. He was screaming at Timothy while it happened. And I hit the, the um, two-way talk button on the camera and said, hey, what the heck, go back to bed. And I actually had to physically go downstairs and get him away from the door and, and send him to bed. Was the, in the text on occasion, Paul would have uh, say things that suggest aggressions <coughs> towards Timothy on occasion. Was that, did you know any other circumstances other than what's in the, those, those situations in the text? Oh, absolutely. Paul was, he never displayed that towards my youngest. He never displayed that towards my husband when he was still at home or myself. Um, he would get aggressive when he was playing games. He would get really angry. He had some serious anger, anger issues. Um, and then when Timothy moved up, and Timothy did push his buttons some, but he just, he never reacted well. I mean, he just overreacted to Timothy every time. It was, he hardly ever reacted rationally to Timothy. And so, uh, other than what he was texting you, and other than what you could see when you weren't working at, at, at your job, uh, you don't have first-hand information as to what's going on between Paul and Timothy. Is that correct? No, I, would, I asked my little guy occasionally, okay. um, but Timothy never told me anything that was going on. Okay. So, um, I did, I mean, I asked just because I, I if, if I, had texted Paul and he seemed upset. Um, then I would get home and, hey, is everything okay? Um, and my my little guy, um, honestly, I don't remember him ever saying that there was there was an issue. He said, yeah, Paul got mad, but that was it. He never said anything happened. Okay. <clears throat> One moment. What was your intent when you would administer punishments to Timothy? To get him to behave. Was it ever your intent to harm him? No, absolutely not. No, I, the, the, uh, the locks on the fridge and freezer, they're actually, he, that was, he scared the heck out of me after my husband's stroke. And that's what brought those two on. Okay. Uh, I can tell you what happened. What was the incident, and then I got a what was the incident that caused you to put locks on the fridge? Um, I had just purchased a two pound bag of frozen chicken nuggets and put it in the freezer. Um, and overnight, I guess he got a around the motion sensors. Um, but the next day, it was a weekend. And the next day I went to, um, little man asked for, for some chicken nuggets. And I went to get them and the, the bag was empty in the freezer. And I was like, what? On? I mean, we hadn't touched it. And so I started asking, and at first Timothy lied to me. He said he didn't touch it. Um, and then I went and checked with little man and with Paul, and nobody had touched the, so I went back, because I had issues with both Paul and Timothy lying to me a lot. Um, so I went back to Timothy. I said, somebody, nobody else has touched this. He said, I ate them. I said, okay, did you cook them? He said, no, he ate the whole two pound bag frozen, okay. uncooked chicken. All right, were you concerned about his health and getting into and eating frozen food? Yes, and um, he ate, um, there was a time where he ate uncooked bacon out of the fridge before the chicken nugget incident. He ate a whole pound of uncooked ground beef at one point. Um, this was all after the stroke when there was less people to keep an eye on. Did it occur to you he's doing those things because he's hungry, he's starving? No, he, I mean, he, there was plenty of food. We were, there was no issues. He never told me he was hungry at the time when these incidents happened. Okay, so fast forward, you offer him two pizza rolls if he does a certain thing. And you say, I don't care if they're frozen when you give them to him. If you're concerned about him eating frozen food, why would you offer him two frozen pizza rolls? Because the chicken was uncooked and it's dangerous. I was, that actually I had a, a panic attack when he did the chicken. It was, it was terrifying. I broke down completely. So the nuggets were uncooked chicken? Yes, it's uncooked chicken. That's, it, it, that could have killed him. Okay. It freaked me out. 
And, but the pizza rolls were at least cooked. Yes, that was just, you frozen. reheated them. Okay. He was, and I'll give you one more, he was rail thin. How did you not notice? I wish I hadn't answered that. Um, part of it, he actually, from the time of the stroke, because my husband's stroke was January 3rd of 2022, so it was, most of this was cold weather. Um, part of it was he wore, he wore big clothes, he wore hoodies. The clothes that were sent to him from his dad and stepmom, um, most of the pants didn't fit him well to begin with. And I had gotten him a couple of pairs of jeans, but I mean, I couldn't afford a lot. Um, and he also, um, once the stroke happened, he got really reclusive. Um, he, he just, I mean, he didn't want, and I had to force him, um, for a while when he was doing his homeschooling, he would do it on his tablet. And then I found out he was, I tried to lock the tablet down, um, but he was doing other stuff on his tablet when he was supposed to be doing schoolwork. So I started the, the curriculum that he was on. You could print the, the assignments and the questions. So I started printing that and um, literally he'd be like, just stick it on the stairs. I'd, and he'd give me the other assignments. I would grade them and stick them in the, and put them into the, the program. But he, he didn't want anything to do with me, hardly at all. Yeah, but when you put your arms around him to hug your he son. He didn't want hugged. He was, he was 15. He didn't, want, he, he didn't want me. And he was autistic, correct? He was. He was high functioning. Okay. But he, most of the autism came with like interactions with other people. He struggled there. Okay. So it wasn't, was it just you he didn't want touching? Or was there anybody, he didn't want anybody else? Um, he didn't want Gabriel, sorry. He didn't want little man hugging him either. Okay. What about Paul? Do you ever uh, see they him? They never offered to hug each other. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Roberts, how, how long do you anticipate your... Oh, I'm thinking at least an hour and a half, Judge. So. Okay. Well, uh, it's a little early before lunch. I think it's a natural time to take a break, unless you prefer to start now, no, Mr. I Roberts. Actually, there's an issue I think that I'd like to address first. It might cut a small chunk of that out, but... It's going to be quite extensive. So I agree that okay. it makes right. sense to break now and maybe come back early. All right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's, uh, we're going to break a little early for lunch. Um, it, you'll be um, allowed to leave the jury room. Uh, you can go wherever you want for lunch. I'd ask you to uh, please wear your badges to and from your vehicles. Uh, that way people know that you're a juror. Uh, please don't talk to anybody. Please don't look at any social media, news reports, articles online. Again. Same applies. Uh, we have to make sure we have an unbiased panel. Um, and um, we'll be back here. I'm going to have you back. Uh, we have some matters to attend to at 1 o'clock. Uh, I'll have you back here at 1.15, uh, hopefully for a 1.30 start. So I'll have the attorneys back here at the same time. So uh, thank you. Uh, we're taking a recess. So please rise. the jury in the jury room. Go ahead, Mr. Roberts. Thank you, Judge. Um, the, I, I guess the only issue I would like some clarity or direction from the court on is this. I, I intend to ask Ms. Van Art questions, and this is tipping hand a little bit. I understand that, but I think it's necessary to get some clarity from the court. I, I, I intend to ask her some questions about why she didn't file any legal documentation to get custody of Timothy Ferguson. 